There was blood in the water, but at least the screaming had stopped. It had been an ill-advised party boat floating out in dangerous waters, where a bachelor party full of rich and naive men had ignored every warning. Some had told them, don't you know that pirates operate in these waters? Others had cautioned, you might get confused for pirates and shot down by military boats. Nobody had expected the impossible monster that had actually killed all ten people who'd gone out there on that warm ocean night. But in the chaos that unfolded the day after, they would find out. A cargo ship carrying hundreds of millions of dollars worth of products and valuable raw materials was scheduled to cross those same waters. If they could have gone any other way, they would have. But with corporate shipping deadlines to reach, they couldn't afford to take the scenic route and potentially add over an entire week to an already long trip. The cargo ship would need to take the risk. They would need to face the pirates on their own turf if it came to that. Meanwhile, on a number of secret compounds on land, the pirates were preparing. Their corrupt government shipping sources had given them a valuable tip about the coming ship, and they were doing everything they could in order to ensure this flagrant act of piracy would be successful. They loaded fuel into the tanks of their speedboats. They clicked magazines full of armor-piercing bullets into their AK-47s. They slipped on bulletproof body armor and clipped grenades to their belts. They were a terrifying force to be reckoned with, but they had no idea that, within a few hours, they would be encountering something far more dangerous. You see, strange things had been happening on some of the world's coastlines. It started with surfers, foolhardy, sun-kissed thrill-seekers with an addiction to catching the biggest waves possible. Of course, there are plenty of surfers who get claimed by the sea every year. It is an occupational hazard, especially for fledgling surfers. But the mysterious circumstances of all the workers had something in common. Blood in the water. Of course, it didn't stop with surfers. Anyone who swam a few feet further than the edge of the water seemed to be at risk. Lonely moonlight swimmers went first, but it didn't take long for whole families to start disappearing in the waves. A few here, a few there. Nothing that most people even noticed, just a whole bunch of unconnected, isolated tragedies. The sea is a cruel mistress, though when looking at these cases, nobody ever considered that something else entirely could be behind all these terrifying disappearances. But back to the cargo ship, making its way across the turbulent waters. And those waters were indeed turbulent, far choppier than the forecast had predicted. The waves were huge, towering even, but that was no excuse to delay their important mission. Their comms had recently received a communique from the local government about the missing party boat and all its occupants, assumed dead the previous night. Pirates, most likely. The cargo ship had come prepared for this eventuality. The companies sponsoring their efforts had lost too much time and money to let their ships be sitting ducks, floating goodie bags for violent criminals. That's why they'd spent a little extra money on a precaution, heavily armed mercenaries patrolling the ship, ready to kill in order to protect their bosses' products. The scene is set for a bloodbath, and certain things out there in the deep love a good bloodbath. The pirates, ready to make a lot of money by any means necessary, loaded into their ships and speedboats, their assault rifles slung on their backs. They took to the waters, howling battle cries as they zeroed in on the cargo ship across the bucking waves. They prepared to fire, but they didn't expect their target to fire back. With no mercy, the mercenaries ran to the edge of the boat and started firing down on the smaller boats surrounding them with machine guns. Several pirates went down, chock full of bullets, dead before they could even figure out what was going on. As their bodies sank amidst the waves, their blood floated on the surface like big, red plumes. While the pirates were shocked at the resistance, they weren't unprepared. You don't get to become the rulers of this particularly tough part of the ocean without being ready to give it even harder than you can take it. In accordance with this, the pirates loaded up the handful of RPGs they brought out with them and fired their deadly payloads at the side of the cargo ship. Boom. 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 The ship was rocked by explosions, knocking over some of the many mercenaries standing on the hull. Some fell, screaming down into the water, where pirates quickly cut them down with bursts of ruthless gunfire. But one mercenary who fell off the back of the boat got lucky, or unlucky depending on your perspective. 
No pirate spotted him, potentially leaving him safe and sound, until he noticed a large wave coming towards him. It took more than a little water to frighten this hardened soldier of fortune, until he saw something nightmarish hiding in the dark. The flash of white fangs and an ivory jaw. It hinged open and bore down on him as the wave prepared to crash. The mercenary screamed, and after the wave hit him, he was gone. Meanwhile, the violent battle between the mercenaries on the cargo ship and the pirates trying to claim it raged on. Using grappling hooks, the pirates were climbing up onto the hull, having disabled the back rudder with sustained gunfire and targeted bombing. The ship was soon suffused with bloodshed, as pirates and mercenaries gunned each other down in bloody combat. Men were falling left and right, but there always seemed to be more. Little by little, as each man fell, there was more and more blood in the water. Out in the depths, as a storm began to rage and the waves whipped and roared, something hungry could smell and taste the blood. One boat full of pirates kept circling the cargo ship like a hungry shark. One worked the engine with practiced efficiency, while another three aimed AK-47s up at the ship, waiting for the moment when another unfortunate mercenary stuck up his head, ready to receive a bullet. But their true enemy wasn't even on the ship. It was sneaking up behind them. Only the man working the speedboat's engine spotted it before it was too late. A wave rose out of the sea, moving with a speed that shocked even this veteran seafarer. At first, he thought nothing of it. Too busy to keep out of the range of mercenary bullets, he was hardly the type to worry about getting wet. And then, he saw the teeth. As the wave rose well above his height and only a few feet away, he saw something impossible floating in the water. A shape he'd been seeing hanging above the fireplace in a bar he'd been frequenting for years. The jaws and teeth of a great white shark. Perhaps it was just refuse from a dead shark floating in the water. That was the most reasonable explanation, right? But if that was the case, why would the jaws be spreading further apart as though ready to receive him? He screamed so loud that his crewmates first assumed he'd taken a bullet, but when they turned around, they saw the truth. A huge wave was crashing down on them, and they saw the teeth. Not just one set, the one that the engine man had seen, but a different set of teeth for each of them. Hungry shark mouths without sharks bearing down. They all screamed, their desperate sounds of terror blending into an incoherent chorus before being cut off by the crash of the waves. The boat was wrecked, empty and bloodstained when the water dissipated, sinking lifelessly to the bottom of the ocean. But, of course, the worst was yet to come. The anomaly in the waves was insatiated. All the mercenaries and pirates it had taken so far were just the appetizer, and now it was ready for the main course. Everyone now on the cargo ship, pirate, mercenary, and sailor caught in between, who was fighting and even dying for money, had no idea what was coming. The wave rumbled and rose behind the ship, getting taller and taller and taller, until even the giant vessel looked like a toy boat in its wake. In the darkness of the wave, hundreds of pairs of gnashing shark jaws, the sharp edges of their teeth glistening, the wave fell upon the ship, sending flesh-eating water coursing through every nook and cranny. When the water cleared, there wasn't a single survivor. The ship, irreparably broken, sank to a metal graveyard down below. Nobody in the normal world would even know what happened. For those with a fear of sharks and deep water, this particular anomaly is a living nightmare, and one that the French division of the SCP Foundation has encountered with unsettling frequency. It's been recorded manifesting off a number of different coastlines, and who even knows how often it's manifested out in deeper waters. Despite its Euclid classification, containing this anomaly has been no mean feat. It's involved shutting down a number of coastlines completely on the pretense of animal research, the administration of Class A amnestics to witnesses and Class B amnestics to victims, as well as a complicated disinformation campaign to suppress photos and reports of the phenomenon online. But even with all of these containment procedures in place, many have still lost their lives to the jaws of SCP-054-FR, or the Great White Wave. By the Foundation's current estimations, recorded attacks by the Great White Wave have been fatal 68% of the time, with survivors often experiencing wounds consistent with those of an abnormally bad shark attack. 
In case our opening case study didn't clue you in, the Great White Wave is a set of ravenous shark jaws, most closely resembling the Carcharodon caracarius, or Great White Shark, manifesting inside ocean waves. Any waves over 4 meters tall can become a host to a Great White Wave event, with there theoretically being no upper limit to the size of a wave capable of causing this kind of anomalous catastrophe. The power of the Great White Wave's bite is also directly proportional to the size of the wave it manifests on, too. Meaning that, in theory, a tsunami playing host to the Great White Wave could devour an entire town. While every attack that the Foundation has failed to prevent is, of course, a tragedy, the number of attacks has allowed the Foundation to uncover some extremely interesting data. For example, while attacks could happen anywhere at sea, they're most common in the 250-meter ocean radius around a coastline. When a human or non-aquatic animal is present in the attack zone, great white waves move at three times the speed of a normal wave in pursuit of its unfortunate prey. The great white wave isn't picky about its prey either. Divers, swimmers, and even aquatic vehicles like boats or jet skis have been devoured, though the waves seem to show a particular preference for surfers, which is gnarly in the typical sense, but not in the sense that surfers say it. The ghostly shark jaws will only become visible next to the part of the wave closest to the victim, meaning that they often aren't spotted until it's too late. But that doesn't mean it can't consume multiple victims at once. As you saw with the unfortunate sailors and pirates in our opening story, many sets of jaws can manifest in the case of having multiple victims to devour. The actual consumption occurs as the wave crashes down upon the victim, so the only recorded way to survive being on the wrong side of the Great White Wave is to dive into the water before the wave crashes. The French Division of the Foundation conducted a series of experiments in hopes of understanding the dynamics of the Great White Wave, which had results both encouraging and disturbing. Based on non-anomalous sharks' ability to electromagnetically sense blood from extreme distances, the Foundation wanted to see if the same could be said for the Great White Wave. After pouring several liters of animal blood into the water of an affected area, they found that a great white wave regularly manifested within two minutes, crashing down and devouring the affected blood. However, an extension of this experiment found an alarming result. The same amount of human blood attracted a great white wave in under 60 seconds. Even a small amount of human blood attracted a great white wave significantly faster than a large amount of animal blood. Interestingly, non-anomalous great white sharks will rarely ever attack humans on purpose. Whenever they do, it's often because they mistook a swimming or surfing human for a seal, their natural prey. You'll often find that most shark attack victims are only bitten once, a common shark behavior known as a testing bite. Once the shark realizes that it isn't eating a seal, it will quickly move along. Yes, this probably won't make the person with a shark bite taken out of them feel any better, but the shark didn't truly want to eat them. Great white waves, by contrast, enjoy eating humans significantly more than animals. But that doesn't mean they won't eat all kinds of animals. Several maritime birds were eaten by a great white wave when they flew in front of the wave that was over 4 meters tall. We suppose the Great White Wave has never heard the salty old sea dog tale that it's bad luck to kill a seabird. The Foundation discovered a few useful things from their experiments. If you want to avoid getting eaten by the Great White Wave, you should avoid getting into the water if you're suffering from any kind of injury. Wounded people are four times as likely to be the victims of attacks, with the Great White Wave manifesting in less than 60 seconds. You can also improve your chances of surviving by following Sam Neill's advice from Jurassic Park. Don't move a muscle. Movement, especially panicked thrashing, has a tendency to lure this unique aquatic predator into your vicinity. But here comes the disappointing part. Other than staying in a landlocked area, there's basically nothing else you can do in order to stop a Great White Wave event. Weapons have proven completely ineffective with the bullets of even the highest caliber weapons simply disappearing into the wall of water. Stealth, beyond avoiding movement, is also ineffective. No attempt to camouflage the smell of humans has been effective in helping them evade the detection of the Great White Wave. You can probably imagine how many unfortunate D-classes got devoured in the process of finding that one out. The Great White Wave is a disturbing reminder that perhaps we shouldn't worry about what lurks in the deep ocean, when nothing has a greater capacity to destroy us than the unimaginable power of the ocean itself. Water. 
the wellspring of life. We've dealt with a number of anomalous water sources on this channel, like SCP-006, the much sought after fountain of youth, or the terrifying SCP-3280, where murderous water threatens to destroy the entire world. But we've never seen anomalous water that behaves quite like this before. In many of the legends of King Arthur, the Sword of Excalibur is presented to him by the mystical Lady of the Lake. This lady emerges from the depths of the water, gifting Arthur with the enchanted sword. It's an incredible, if impossible, image. A woman appearing from within the lake, rising up from the bottom and breaking through the surface. It's safe to say that none of us have ever seen anything quite like it. Well, at least most of us haven't. In a small unnamed English village, there was a young woman who set out on a particularly lovely warm spring day to take a swim in a nearby lake. While wading in the water enjoying the sunlight and the gentle breeze on her skin, she saw a strange ripple ghost across the surface. She stopped her swimming, staring at the motion. She expected to spot a fish or some other aquatic creature. Instead, the water itself began to rise up, gathering and forming into a shape before her eyes. It was impossible, and yet here it was, happening. She pinched herself and found that she was definitely awake, as the water transformed into the shape of a human woman. It turned to look at her, shimmering eyes finding hers and liquid lips forming into a warm, inviting smile. Though this being was shocking to see, it clearly meant her no harm. It raised a translucent arm and gave her a small wave, as if to welcome her to its home. The young woman approached this lady of the lake, reaching out her own hand of flesh and bone to touch this impossible creature. Just as her fingertips reached the water woman's own, the figure dissolved back into the lake with a splash. The young woman ran home, telling anyone who would listen about the incredible thing she had seen that day. Of course, no one believed her. That is, until word of her sighting reached the only people who might take her claim seriously. The SCP Foundation. They sent operatives to the lake, where they managed to capture the shape-shifting entity dwelling there. SCP-054, also known as the Water Nymph, is a being made up entirely of water, with an average volume of 90 liters. When it is out of a body of water, the being tends to adopt the appearance of a humanoid woman, though it is capable of taking on a variety of other shapes including other humanoids, animals, and various inanimate objects. The entity is also capable of shedding its form and effectively disappearing into a given body of water. In order to avoid shrinking or possibly disappearing entirely from evaporation, SCP-054 is required to return to a larger body of water. Studies of samples taken from the entity's body, or its version of a body, reveal that it is made up of ordinary water. There is no apparent reason for its ability to move, and no thermal, electromagnetic, biological, or supernatural anomalies were detected. The research team could not determine what might make this water alive and sentient, and the nature of its unusual properties is uncertain to this day. When SCP-054 was first brought into containment at Site-08, it displayed surprisingly congenial and curious behavior, often walking around outside of the water and taking turns mimicking the shapes of various staff and scientists that spoke to it. Its demeanor began to shift towards suspicion and aggression, however, following a series of experiments and an incident involving the research staff. The first experiment conducted on SCP-054 sought to determine what would happen if the entity was denied access to any fresh water. Water was drained from the fountain holding it, leaving only enough water for it to form a humanoid shape, but no additional water in the basin to compensate for the effects of evaporation over time. SCP-054 became visibly frustrated as the water was being drained out of its enclosure. For the next few days, it enthusiastically greeted anyone who entered its containment facility, attempting to use a report and sense of familiarity to convince the person to provide it with more water. After it realized that this approach had no impact on the amount of water in its fountain, it became distant and even cold to anyone who attempted to speak to it. 054 only became friendly again once the water in its fountain was restored to a pre-experiment level. Next, the research team opted to test SCP-054's reaction to extreme temperatures, particularly extreme cold. The temperature of the containment facility was slowly dropped until the room fell below the freezing point of water. As the temperature dropped, 054 became sluggish and exhausted. It lost its ability to shift between forms, remaining locked in its preferred humanoid female shape. 
Its movement slowed more and more as the room grew colder, until the entity was completely frozen solid. Portions of the ice were chipped off and studied, revealing the crystals were identical to those of ordinary ice. After the Sub-Zero testing, the research team decided to take things to the other end of the spectrum and test the effects of heat on SCP-054. The subject was placed in a tank outfitted with heating equipment, and its temperature was slowly raised over the course of several minutes. When the water reached a temperature of 95 degrees, the entity's behavior became frenetic and aggressive. It pounded on the glass walls of the tank and attempted to break through the lid in a desperate bid for escape until the temperature was returned to a comfortable level. After the extreme temperature experiments, the previous calm and cooperative nature of SCP-054 was nowhere to be found. The subject displayed increased suspicion of the research team and would fight back whenever it was removed from its fountain and taken to a lab for experimentation. In spite of this newfound resistance, the team decided to continue their experiments as planned, hoping that the entity would return to its formerly docile self over time. Next, Dr. Seskel, the acting head of the research team, conducted a study involving SCP-054's memory and ability to be conditioned. The entity was presented with a series of increasingly complex mazes and puzzles. When it failed to comply with the experiment or solved a puzzle incorrectly, the entity was punished with an electrical shock or the release of silica gel into its body. Both of these options seemed to cause it a great deal of pain and distress, and it was eager to avoid further exposure to them. SCP-054 displayed impressive learning and problem-solving capabilities, revealing it is likely much more intelligent than it was first presumed to be. Dr. Seskel, observing the experiments and with the effectiveness of his somewhat unsavory motivational techniques, quipped to his research assistant that they would have it trained to fetch in no time. After several days of these experiments and repeated use of both the silica gel and electrical shocks, the entity's progress slowed down considerably and it became visibly exhausted. It was removed from the lab for a 48-hour rest period before experimentation was resumed yet again. This time, Dr. Seskel planned to expose SCP-054's water source to various levels of acids and bases in order to test its homeostatic capabilities, beginning with a 0.5M solution of hydrochloric acid. Prior to conducting the experiment, Dr. Seskel noted, I have no idea what will happen, but if this thing incorporates homeostatic mechanisms like I suspect, then we should get some insight into how it maintains its form. He also noted that SCP-054's behavior was becoming increasingly erratic, but made the decision to continue with the experiment as planned. SCP-054 displayed a now familiar reluctance when it was removed from its containment chamber and taken to the lab. It thrashed around in the fountain, splashing researchers with water, and retreated from them as they approached. In spite of its efforts, however, it was removed from its fountain and placed in the experimental tank. The solution of hydrochloric acid was then dripped into the tank, and then all hell broke loose. As soon as the acid touched the surface of its water, SCP-054 became incredibly distressed. It formed into the shape of a human face, eyes wide, mouth open in a silent scream of rage and pain. The water churned so aggressively that the lid of the tank was shaken loose, allowing it to escape the boundaries of its containment. The water formed into two large hands, which shot out of the tank and grabbed the two nearest researchers, pulling them into the water and exposing their skin to the acid now present there. As the men scrambled to drag themselves back out of the tank and their colleagues were busy helping them, SCP-054 took on its usual humanoid form and ran for the door. It then collapsed into a puddle, slipped under the crack in the bottom of the door, and made its way down the hall. It was apprehended roughly 10 minutes after its escape by a team of guards, who froze it using canisters of liquid nitrogen and then carried its icy body back to the containment facility. The two researchers who had been pulled into the tank experienced chemical burns on their skin, as well as significant mental distress. They were given immediate medical attention and placed on a leave of absence, and all experimentation on SCP-054 was suspended until further notice. At the recommendation of Dr. Seskel, 054's object class was changed to Euclid. SCP-054 is currently contained in a watertight isolation room, fitted with climate control equipment. A beautiful, intricately designed fountain has been placed in the center of the containment room, filled with fresh spring water in order to accommodate the entity's environmental needs. All maintenance workers assigned to the area must wear NBC suits while inside, and must spend 10 minutes isolated in a drying room after exiting before they are permitted to return to the rest of the facility. If 054 breaches containment, 
The area must be evacuated, and the containment chamber will be filled with liquid nitrogen in order to freeze its water solid. As the entity is highly sensitive to the conditions of the water that houses it, chemical levels and volume of the water in the fountain must be monitored on a regular basis and kept at optimal levels for the health of SCP-054. During the course of its containment, following the incident around the Acid Base Incorporation experiment, 054 has developed a distrust of men, as the researchers handling that experiment were primarily male. In order to prevent future incidents and keep SCP-054 calm, no male staff are to be assigned to the team monitoring its containment unit. Because five years have passed since the last incident involving SCP-054, its object class has been changed from Euclid to SAFE, on the recommendation of the lead researcher assigned to its case. Of course, caution should still be exercised while interacting with the entity. This is the SCP Foundation, after all. And just because a moderate amount of water is good for you, doesn't mean you can't still drown. Experimentation on SCP-054 has resumed, though this time its boundaries are being honored, and it is allowed adequate time to rest and recuperate between experiments. All use of punishment in order to motivate the entity has been suspended, as it has shown itself to be more than willing to cooperate if it is treated with respect. Like all of us, it responds far better to kindness than it does to fear and intimidation. It doesn't just take on the appearance of a person, it has thoughts, feelings, and the urge to defend itself when threatened. So think twice next time you find yourself swimming in a random body of water. You should be mindful of what might be living in there. Not just of the fish, the algae, and the tiny water bugs, but of the invisible, intelligent, impossible creatures that might be swimming in there with you, or even make up the very water itself. It was just a job. You were meant to be mopping floors and cleaning toilets at the Johnston Labs and Pharmaceuticals Research Center for minimum wage, and you were happy about it, grateful for any kind of employment. You didn't even know that the company signing your checks was the SCP Foundation, an organization dedicated to securing and containing anomalies and protecting humanity from their negative effects at any cost. And today, you're going to find out exactly how steep that cost can be. The Johnston Labs and Pharmaceuticals Research Center isn't actually a research center at all. It's a foundation front business, with a building solely dedicated to the containment of a single anomaly. SCP-3280. But again, you're just the janitor. It's not like they would bother telling you what's being contained here. If it breaks out, you won't even know what's killing you until it's too late. It begins, like most classic horror stories, on a dark and stormy night. You're mopping up a silent hallway, whistling a little tune to yourself, when rain starts hammering down on the window next to you. Not long after, you see a bolt of lightning split the distant sky, followed by an immense thundercrack. Soon after, you hear screaming and panicking from below, frantic footsteps, then the flashing lights and sirens. You think back to your employee orientation. These flashing lights and wailing sirens can only mean one thing, containment breach. You run for it, not even knowing what you're running from. You bring your mop and bucket with you, perhaps just out of habit, you seek refuge in the only place in the facility that truly seems to belong to you, the broom closet. The alarm blares as you lock yourself in the closet. You're shaking with terror and can hear the screaming of your colleagues. You hear more noises, running, scrambling, a wet dripping sound, gunshots, and then silence. All this time you can't help but wonder, why isn't anybody coming to help us? After a while, the only thing you can hear is the rain and the distant thunder. It's been hours. You've only managed to stave off dehydration by drinking the filthy water from the mop sink, but at least it seems like the chaos outside has died down. Carefully, you open the door and peek out of the closet. Darkness, but no detectable movement. Now's your chance and you make a break for it, creeping down the hall. The dark hallway is suddenly lit up by lightning, and you can see that there are bodies everywhere. You step over the corpse of Dr. Cothrone, one of the few scientists working here who actually knew your name. If you can make it to the security office, you might be able to radio for help, or maybe access a computer terminal. On the way to the office, you hear another horrific scream start to echo through the complex before it's cut off by a thunderclap. You have to ignore it, though, and push on. 
When you enter the security room, you see that the head security officer, Nichols, is already dead. His body has been cut open from neck to groin, gutted. The anomaly, whatever it is, has already been here. You access the computer terminal and open the file for SCP-3280. You're warned that as janitorial staff, you have level zero clearance, and as a result, information will be omitted from the files you access. It doesn't matter. You press on and open up the file. Both the object class and the description have been redacted. You can only see the special containment procedures. They dictate that 3280 is to remain contained at the Johnston Labs and Pharmaceuticals Research Center until long-term containment procedures can be drawn up. If the entity ever reaches beyond sublevel 2, the facility enters full lockdown mode. Not even information is allowed in or out of the facility as this could result in an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. In other words, nobody is coming to save you. The only other information on the page is a picture of a lightning storm, much like the one you find yourself in right now. Lightning flashes in the hall. You dart around paranoid, knowing the anomaly could be anywhere. All you can hear now is the quiet drip, drip, drip of blood coming from the body of Security Officer Nichols. Whatever this thing had done to him looked painful. You try to remember him as he was in life, and then a revelation hits you. A security officer probably has a lot better clearance than a janitor. You feel around Nichols' mutilated torso until you find his keycard. Thankfully, Nichols was the kind of guy who'd write his password on the underside of this card so he wouldn't forget it. You easily gain access to the Foundation servers with his login credentials. You now have level two security clearance. The terminal gives you the option to view security footage taken throughout the site. You're given access to every camera still working after the containment breach and the subsequent carnage. You select the camera feed for the second floor barracks. There you see researcher Jensen hanging from a makeshift noose attached to his bunk. There's a puddle underneath his corpse. You access the feed from the second floor east wing. There you see Dr. Emanuel stumbling down a dark corridor. His movements are oddly listless, like he's in a trance. Suddenly, there's another flash of lightning and a crack of thunder. Dr. Emanuel clutches his gut in pain and crumples to the floor. You access the camera feed from the first floor entrance. It seems that the whole area is flooded. Is this because of the storm? In a panic, many lower tier staff members had tried to escape defying the lockdown protocols and the special containment procedures. Now they're floating face down in the water, all dead. You access the camera feed from sublevel two and see another corpse lying in the corner. He's wearing an orange jumpsuit, D-class. No idea why he was down there. The only other notable thing in the basement was a burst pipe leaking and spraying more water everywhere. With trembling fingers, you select the camera feed for the first floor cafeteria. The whole room is practically underwater. The only evidence of the massacre that must have taken place are the fragments of clothing floating on the surface of the water. That, and the fleshy pink slurry forming at the bottom of the windows. It reminds you of the gooey meat runoff in chicken nugget factories. You close your eyes and try to center yourself. It's violent chaos. Looking at more of it isn't getting you anywhere. Instead, you put those new Level 2 security access credentials to good use, and hop back onto the file for SCP-3280. You think to yourself, there has to be something I can use on here. But even as you wait for the file to load, some part of you knows that time is running out for you. Perhaps it's the stress, or the fear, or the filthy mop water you drank. But you're feeling the pressure start to mount, physically. Your stomach is beginning to ache. You can see blurry shapes moving in the corners of your eyes. It's getting harder to focus your vision and harder still to quiet the terrified voices in your mind. But you can't get up, not without knowing what is doing this to you. The containment class for SCP-3280 is now declassified, Euclid, and once more, the special containment procedures have altered too. They now explain that every week, a new member of D-Class personnel is to be deposited into the entity's lair in sublevel 2 through subterranean access point Gamma. The D-Class, or more accurately, the sacrifices, are to be told lies about why exactly they need to descend to the lowest point in the facility. They're even given a working flashlight and a defensive nightstick 
to create the illusion that the Foundation expects them to ever return from the depths. Little do they know, they also have a tiny transmitter sewn into their jumpsuit. This broadcasts a frequency that will attract an eager SCP-3280 to the D-Class's location, like a dinner bell only it can hear. The file specifies that SCP-3280 always prefers live prey. Well, at least that explains the dead D-Class in sublevel 2, you think, hoping that it will somehow overwhelm the dizziness you're feeling, or the nagging pain in your gut. You read on. Somehow the file's tone becomes even more severe. It says that failure to maintain the containment of SCP-3280 will not only trigger a lockdown, it will always call in the intervention of two different mobile task forces, MTF IOTA-12, The Silencers, and Tau-4, also known as Water Water Everywhere. If 12 hours pass from the point of initial containment breach and the O5 Council hasn't been given the all-clear signal by one of these teams, Preparation begins for an imminent XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. Just reading the words sends you into a cold sweat. End-of-the-world? What on earth is this creature? Finally, you reach the description. You get to find out what this horrifying entity actually is. But the last thing you expect is the first sentence in the file to read, SCP-3280 is a sapient entity composed of a fluid physically identical to water capable of traveling roughly two and a half kilometers per hour. It's water. It's literally a living, thinking blob of water. As you read on, the concerning details pile up. Any water that the anomalous SCP-3280 water touches, it integrates it into its own mass. But any time water is separated from this mass, it remains anomalous and continues to act independently. When the creature was first discovered, it was a mere 66.4 liters in volume. Now it's around 2,500. The water infected by SCP-3280 is hostile to all humans, and not just in a defensive manner. SCP-3280 will actively seek out human prey, and when it finds them, it forces its mass into any available body orifice, including the victim's pores. This can happen in such a subtle manner that you may not even notice yourself being infiltrated. But below this, the file has a list of symptoms for those experiencing 3280 infiltration, loss of motor control, weakening of the micturition reflex, visual hallucinations, and abdominal pain. As you read the words, your stomach gives another painful churn, almost like something is moving around inside of you. It's all coming together. You read on. The file states that SCP-3280 is so difficult to contain because it exhibits claustrophobic tendencies. Any time it's placed inside a container, whether organic or inorganic, it escapes with pressurized water jets that travel at over 255 miles per hour. If the water is inside a human, it may literally explode out of them, killing them in the process. Your jittering eyes turn to the gutted body of Security Officer Nichols. It all makes sense now. Everything is becoming clearer as the pain in your stomach builds in its intensity. The file goes on to say that if SCP-3280 escapes sublevel 2, it may be impossible to contain again. If 3280 ever escaped the site proper, it would indeed cause an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario to unfold, as 3280 merged with our water cycle and destroyed all of humanity on a global scale. It would become truly impossible for anyone to escape. You can't read anymore. The pain in your stomach is unbearable. You jerk from your seat and stumble out into the hall, doubled over in agony. You can feel it pulsing in there, fighting its way out. It must have gotten in through the filthy mop water you were drinking. You didn't even know it, but your fate has been sealed for hours. You've been a dead man walking. The hum of pain builds in your ears and renders you almost deaf. All you can hear is the pattern of rain and distant thunder. You collapse against the glass, feeling the coolness of it against the skin of your face. And in that moment, you see the water droplets on the window pane reverse direction. They're slithering up the glass towards your face in defiance of gravity. Then you realize it's all over. And not just for you. SCP-3280 has escaped. It's out there, and it's going to drown the entire world. As you collapse to your knees and prepare to be torn apart from the inside, your final thought is that at least you won't be alive to see it. You're right in the middle of one of the hottest summers on record. 
The days are filled with bright, scorching sun and searing heat, and you've been laying around with your air conditioning on full blast just to try and cool yourself off. Sadly, it's not really working, and the heat is becoming way too much. But then you remember there's this married couple that lives near you, with no kids, and they happen to have a swimming pool in their yard. Normally, they keep to themselves, they'd never let you use their pool, but they've gone out of town for a few days. Besides, the heat is killing you. You're sure that the neighbors wouldn't mind if you just took a quick dip, as long as you clean up after yourself. They probably wouldn't even notice you were even there. Cautiously, you make your way to their house. It's an unremarkable place similar to most of the other houses in this suburb of New Mexico. After checking that there's nobody else around, you climb the two-meter-high cinder block wall that stands around the back garden. As you drop to your feet, sweaty and panting from the unrelenting summer heat, you see it. The pool. Your salvation. Water never looks so appealing. Immediately, you step barefoot across the sun-scorched tiles and sit on the edge, legs in the water. It's cool and refreshing, perfect for a day as hot as today. You're already changed and wearing your swim trunks, so it doesn't take long for you to paddle out to the middle of the pool, letting that chilled, clean water cool you off. As you're taking a dip, you notice the pool's jets turning on automatically. It's a little bit odd, but you shrug it off. That couple clearly shelled out for a pool with a lot of fancy bells and whistles. But extra features aren't why you're here. You came because if you didn't, then you could have melted under all that sunlight. Floating on the surface of the water, you relax with your arms behind your head and close your eyes. You don't have time to realize that coming here was a mistake. Instead, you start to feel relaxed. So calm. So tranquil. You're one with the water around you now. It's almost as though you could just disappear. So, you do. The police never find any trace of you. Everyone else simply writes it off as a random disappearance. There's not even so much as a scrap of your body left in the pool. Just the clear, clean water. Why? Because the swimming pool you decided to take a cooling dip in wasn't an ordinary pool. It was SCP-242. But don't worry. You won't be the last to make that costly mistake. What you didn't know is that the married couple who live in that house are secretly a pair of SCP Foundation doctors. The house isn't even theirs. The Foundation procured it after the former owner, a retired out-of-state landlord, strangely vanished. He had been struggling to find anyone to rent the place, so he eventually decided to give up on the property game and move in there himself. After three days, he was never seen again. Now that house has only one rule that must be followed above all else. Do not swim in the pool. SCP-242 is, at least to the untrained eye, just an average swimming pool. A decent 9 meters in length, 4.5 wide, and it holds around 53,000 liters of sterile pool water. Like we mentioned before, it's even got some nifty features like water jets, a dual waterfall, and a built-in vacuum unit for sucking out any impurities. And we mean any impurities. You see, SCP-242 does go by another name, the self-cleaning pool. And while that might not sound as foreboding or dramatic as the Scarlet King or the Wendigo Skull or the horrifying nasty dude of ultimate badness, okay, we made that last one up, we can assure you that you don't ever want to suffer the fate of taking a swim in this pool. There was an incident a while ago, recorded by the Foundation through a secret hidden camera. The house where SCP-242 can be found had been left vacant for a time, and once again some opportunists decided to take advantage of the empty swimming pool. This time it was a couple, a man and a woman in their early 20s. They climbed up the back wall, undressed, and even stole a couple of plastic inflatable rafts from a shed in the house's backyard. The water jets switched themselves on, startling the girl, but her boyfriend told her not to worry. The filter to clean the pool was probably just on an automatic timer, right? Surely it wouldn't have been anything to worry about. After swimming together for around 24 minutes, the couple both agreed that the water felt warm, tingly even. Both of them climbed onto their rafts, eventually falling asleep while still holding each other's hands. But almost half an hour after the jets had started, something caused the two rafts to burst. 
The couple awoke, startled by the loud pop of the splitting inflatables and being plunged back into the water. The pool around them immediately began frothing violently, deep red streams of blood swirling through the water as the couple screamed in fear and agony. Both of them tried to desperately swim to the edge, hoping to leave the pool and get to safety. But unfortunately, that plan didn't work. Before they could reach the edge, the man and the woman were pulled under the surface of the raging water, their limbs thrashing as they still tried in vain to escape. Eventually, they vanished under the crimson, bloody water. The frothing slowly began to calm, and the red in the pool dissipated, once again becoming clear after 48 seconds. The couple were never seen again, and a cover story was leaked to the press by the SCP Foundation two weeks after they went missing. According to them, the pair had eloped together somewhere in Mexico. If only. That sounds a lot nicer than what actually happened to them. So this swimming pool clearly has some anomalous properties, that much is obvious. But what exactly are those properties? How exactly does SCP-242 work? Is it an interdimensional gateway that drags people to a nasty alternate universe if they spend too long swimming in it? Or is the swimming pool itself a sentient, carnivorous creature that lures humans in only to devour them? Maybe the water is teeming with invisible flesh-eating piranhas that can strip the meat from the bone in a matter of seconds. Well, good guesses all around, but actually, it's none of these. It's unclear what causes the pool's anomalous effects. It could be a property that is completely unique to the water contained in SCP-242. Or maybe it's down to the exact shape and measurements of the pool itself. It could even be a combination of both. But whatever the cause, the result is always the same. When any object, substance, or even living organism is placed in SCP-242, it will be entirely rewritten on a molecular level. The genetic anatomic structure will fall apart, and the subject will be transmuted into sterile water. In fact, not just clean water, but water that remains sterile even when removed from the pool. If you took a cup of SCP-242's water and mixed something like food coloring into it, the food coloring would not be absorbed into the water, instead staying as one non-missable bubble. This process doesn't happen instantly, though. It can vary depending on how contaminated or complex the substance placed in SCP-242 is. For example, water sampled from a nearby river was sterilized and purified by the pool in about seven minutes. A sample of stagnant pond water riddled with various diseases and germs took 11 minutes longer. What about 50,000 liters of coal tar? Well, that one took a little longer. 12 long days, to be exact. But was still turned into pure, sterile water. And as for a living human being? Maybe ask that couple that took a dip in the self-cleaning pool. The Foundation is naturally fascinated with the pool, and after extensive examination, they have determined that SCP-242 doesn't seem to have been intentionally designed for the specific anomalous function it performs. The components of SCP-242 beyond the pool itself, the filter, the vacuum, the pipes, none of these parts nor anything about the swimming pool's design appear to be responsible for disintegrating matter until only water remains. You might have noticed that in the case of the ill-fated couple who took a swim in SCP-242, the water jets and waterfall features switched themselves on automatically before the pair's grim demise. Somehow, these features are able to activate without the need for electricity, as disconnecting the pool from a power source will not stop the jets and waterfall from coming on once a non-water substance is placed into SCP-242. The same goes for the pool vacuum, which apparently cannot be jammed or malfunction, even when the bottom of the pool is awash with viscous liquids like that coal tar. The vacuum will continue to operate as normal, scrubbing away at the floor of SCP-242. The one part of the self-cleaning pool that doesn't work as you would expect is the water filtration system. There is never any water being cycled into the pool nor out of it. As a matter of fact, the pipes connecting to the filtration system have all been removed. Then again, who needs a filtration system when your backyard swimming pool can just spontaneously reduce anything to clean water? But that raises another frightening thought. Everything that the pool has ever taken and converted is still in there. Animals, objects, people, just swimming around you. Perhaps if they could still think, they'd scream and shout and tell you to get away. 
to run while you still can. But the second your skin touches the water, you're destined to be with them forever and ever and ever. It's enough to send a liquid chill down your spine. Okay, so if it's not the actual physical pool that causes these anomalous effects, that must mean it's something in the water, right? Perhaps some microscopic flesh-devouring microbe, or some ancient curse that was placed on the water before it was used to fill up the pool. Surely if you took a cup of water out of SCP-242, it would still break down structures on a molecular level, leaving only more sterile water. Well, the researchers working at the SCP Foundation thought much of the same and conducted a series of tests to determine the exact properties of SCP-242's water. One test involved submerging two D-Class test subjects, each wearing an atmospheric dive suit, into SCP-242. The goal was to determine if it was safe to consume the water from SCP-242 while both inside and outside of the pool. Test Subject A was lowered into the water and instructed to drink from a metal straw by their mouth. The eyepieces of their goggles were blacked out, so they couldn't see what they were drinking from. Subject B filled a barrel with the same water from SCP-242 and then was made to put on an atmospheric dive suit, but instructed to stay out of the pool. Test Subject A was told to drink directly from the pool, remarking that the water was warm and had a bit of a noticeable chemical aftertaste, but was otherwise normal. Then, Test Subject B drank some of the same water from the barrel. Apparently, it was cool and tasted of… well, nothing, just like water usually does. After a moment more of drink, Subject A began belching, finding that they had uncontrollable gas. The water had begun to feel warmer, stinging the subject's mouth while, for Subject B, the water from the barrel stayed cool and refreshing. The Foundation doctors overseeing the experiment instructed Test Subject A to keep drinking which they did until it felt even hotter to the taste. One of the D-Class's fillings even fell out, and eventually the structural integrity of Subject A's dive suit failed, presumably disintegrated by the water from SCP-242. After a few muffled screams and gurgling noises, Test Subject A wasn't heard from again, and we can all probably guess why. As for Subject B, they kept drinking from the barrel, suffering no adverse effects even after 17 long hours. There were no noticeable psychological or physical changes, even their urine showed no traces of abnormality. The water from SCP-242 left in the barrel evaporated as normal, leaving behind no residue or any indicator as to why taking the water out of the pool made it safer to drink than the same water in the pool. Perhaps the moral of the story is to just be careful where you choose to take a swim. Otherwise, it could be your last. Commander McGrath, one of the most influential members of Mobile Task Force Alpha-1, better known as the Red Right Hand, had been summoned by his masters for one of the most important missions of his life. It was so above top secret, even he would likely need to undergo amnestic treatment once he'd seen the job through. It comes with the territory when you're dealing with SCP-006. The Red Right Hand is no ordinary mobile task force either. They were the personal enforcers of the O5 Council, the 13 most powerful members of the SCP Foundation, and, by extension, some of the most powerful human beings on Earth. Commander McGrath stood before the assembled Council, trying to suppress the tremors of fear and awe running through him. He'd gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with SCP-076 Abel, one of the finest humanoid warriors ever known, during one of his many containment breaches. He led strike forces after a fleeing SCP-682, the hard-to-destroy reptile, after it escaped its acid tank and began charging towards the nearest populated area intent on causing mass death. He'd personally taken out more people than you've probably ever met all at the behest of his Foundation's superiors. And yet, standing right here before them, he couldn't help feel a twinge of deep terror. It was like staring right into the face of God and waiting for it to blink. With his well-honed military observation skills, he noted that O5-2 wasn't among the Council this time, but he knew better than to ask why. He was employed to take orders, not to ask questions. And this time, his orders were something special. He wasn't given any more information than this. McGrath, we need you to lead an elite team to a Strachan in Russia on the double. Procedure 006 is now in effect. You know what to do. 
McGrath nodded. Mm -hmm. He'd been prepared for this day. His predecessor, Commander Richards, had only needed to enact Procedure 006 once in his long and storied career with the red right hand. It was truly a once-in-a-lifetime assignment, and now the torch had been passed to him. The only question was whether he'd be up to the task, but McGrath didn't have time to ponder on this question. Time was of the essence. First, he needed to assemble a team, small but focused. Loyal men who'd keep their heads down, complete the mission, and take the forbidden knowledge no further than the bounds of said mission. McGrath selected three operatives, Bennett, DiMaggio, and Stewart, all of whom had proven valuable assets in prior missions. They would be the ones to accompany him on this most valuable and secretive of directives, Procedure 006. But before they could execute the mission itself, they needed to be trained, briefed, and fitted with the proper equipment. For a mission this sensitive, and dealing with an anomaly as deadly as SCP-006, they needed to wear modified Class 6 B and C suits. These are the ultimate total exclusion hazmat suits, designed specifically by the SCP Foundation. They offered such a degree of protection that they made regular hazmat suits look like bikinis. Commander McGrath actually knew very little about SCP-006 and how it worked. Like many of the more top-secret anomalies contained by the Foundation, only the O5 Council understood the full scope of it. Everyone below them were only told the specific fragments of information they needed to do their job. After all, filling your head with the wrong kinds of knowledge can get your memory wiped, or worse, at the SCP Foundation. SCP-006, as far as Commander McGrath knew, was the more traditional kind of toxic. He'd been briefed using the SCP-006-B info pack, a heavily redacted description of SCP-006. Safe class, liquid in nature, but one of the most toxic substances known to man. It made mercury and uranium look like a glass of mineral water. And more dangerous still, if someone came into contact with even the tiniest quantity of SCP-006's liquids, they would not only be marked for certain death, they would also become a vector for transmission, a veritable plague rat, a walking danger to all mankind. That's why the Class 6 BNC suits needed to be tested. McGrath, Bennett, DiMaggio, and Stewart suited up in a secure Foundation training facility and fully submerged themselves in a training pool. This was how they made sure that there were no vulnerabilities in the suits. If any bubbles were generated, it meant there was a leak. And if there was a leak, then the person wearing the defective suit was as good as dead when they reached the real 006. Lucky for them, no leaks. They were ready to proceed to the next stage of the mission, making their way to Astrakhan, Russia, where SCP-006 was contained. The pressure was on, with the Council growing more impatient by the moment, so they needed to make the journey immediately. Every minute counted, and Commander McGrath was painfully aware of the time slipping away. Though he couldn't possibly fathom why they need a toxic chemical like this with such urgency, they made their journey in a covert cargo plane. It was beyond important to keep all Foundation activity around SCP-006 under wraps. A number of groups of interest cells were active in the area, including the Church of the Broken God and the Serpent's Hand. And if ever the dreaded Chaos Insurgency caught wind of SCP-006's existence and triangulated its location, the damage it could do would be unprecedented. That's why nobody but the O5 Council could truly be trusted with this almost sacred knowledge. When they touched down in Astrakhan, they met with a Foundation courier who would take them on the final leg of their journey to the Foundation site roughly 60 kilometers west of the town. McGrath and his team had no idea what they were headed towards, or the insane history of the land they traversed, all because of SCP-006. The Foundation had first become aware of the anomaly back during the 19th century, but were unable to gain control of it until 1991, due to it being fiercely guarded by a procession of territorial Russian rulers. The blood of hundreds of thousands had been spilled on this land in the historic wars and conflicts over SCP-006. So many had wasted their entire lives unsuccessfully trying to find it. During the several-hour car trip to the site, Commander McGrath had no idea of the true value of the anomaly he and his small team were heading towards. But he would 
in time. Though an innocent would have to die first. The courier dropped the four operatives off outside an abandoned chemical plant in the sticks, far from what anyone would call civilization. It was the kind of industrial decay you could expect in the badlands of rural Russia, a huge complex weathered and broken by time. But what the untrained observer wouldn't realize is that the plant was actually full of heavily trained and even more heavily armed Foundation security personnel. As McGrath's team approached the building, they had no less than eight sniper rifles pointed at them from various vantage points within the plant, just to be safe. The Foundation couldn't afford to take any chances with SCP-006. They arrived at the gate and provided their clearance credentials. They were envoys, here on behalf of the O5 Council themselves, and if they weren't allowed to complete their mission, then the 006 personnel would have the death of a council member on their hands. With that, the team was given a free pass into the site, under close observation. Anyone seeking to interface SCP-006 was forced to do so under almost microscopic scrutiny. Even when inside the building, McGrath and his men needed to pass multiple secure checkpoints throughout the halls, each time restating their security credentials. Eventually, they reached a different section of the building, foreboding anomalous hallways gave way to what seemed like a mix of a garden and a jungle. But the plants were different. The trees, the shrubs, even the weeds were unlike anything members of the team had ever seen before. It was like stepping into an alien world, or perhaps this world, but as it was a few million years prior, it was terrifying and wondrous. They suited up in their Class 6 BNC suits, fearing airborne contaminants from SCP-006 before proceeding further. They walked through this new jungle, being watched at every turn by security cameras and personnel posted throughout this overgrown portion of the facility. It didn't take long for them to reach their destination. The legendary SCP-006, a small natural spring jutting out of a rock surrounded by rich, emerald grass. It looked more like a nice place to have a picnic than a dangerous and highly secretive anomaly, but McGrath wasn't paid to question things, only to carry out Procedure 006. The only object they had with them was the quad sealant container, an ultra-secure liquid containment unit specifically designed for safely transporting samples of SCP-006's water between sites. The team members descended into the spring and began filling up the container. It was nerve-wracking, knowing the stakes of their mission, and knowing that they were submerged in such a deadly substance. But they had a job to do, and they were going to do it come hell or high water. They filled the containment unit, but sadly for McGrath and his team, the mission wouldn't be entirely without casualty. A single bubble rose from the leg of Stewart's suit. He was a good MTF operative, but the youngest and least experienced member of the team. His suit must have somehow been damaged during transit, and now he was compromised. He shared a haunting glance with McGrath and his fellow team members knowing that his part of the mission and his life was about to come to a swift and violent end. Alarms rang out across the facility. A huge team of armed operatives, all wearing Class 6 BNC suits, charged into the room. Stewart was grabbed and manhandled out of the 006 spring, while his fellow team members sealed the containment unit and continued their mission. There was no time to stop, rest, or mourn. Completing the mission was the absolute priority. If McGrath understood the protocol as well as he thought he did, Stewart would be dragged into a secure room by the site staff and locked in with a blast door. He would look down and notice the floor below him was a metal grate caked with ash. His last thoughts, as the incinerator launches its flames into action, would strangely be the fact that he was feeling the healthiest he'd been in years. But that wouldn't stop the sudden furnace around him from decimating his body and leaving little more than ash and charred bones. Over a decade of loyal MTF service ended in an instant. Stewart would have been terminated. According to orders from the top, it was all that could be done for those afflicted by SCP-006. A mercy, really, if they were to be believed. McGrath and his team soldiered on. After retrieving the sample, they were hurried back into their inception point one of the many classified bases occupied by the O5 Council members. While DiMaggio and Bennett were ushered off to be given amnestic treatment, McGrath would personally get to see the containment unit and its precious cargo make the final leg of the journey. 
He was going to be granted access to 05-2, the person this had all been in service of. Commander McGrath approached the secure quarters of the council member, escorted by a bevy of heavily armed security personnel. The doors open and he saw her there, 05-2 bedridden laying at the center of a grand web of life-saving technology. She was beyond old and decrepit. Commander McGrath could see the centuries she'd endured written deeply in the wrinkles and scars of her ancient face. She didn't look like one of the most powerful people in the world. She looked like one of the most feeble. Her eyes lit up when McGrath entered the room holding the containment unit. She beckoned him closer, until he was close enough for her to take the containment unit from him with scarred, trembling hands. McGrath watched in horror as she disengaged the lid and swigged down the entirety of its contents. But wasn't the water toxic? He thought. McGrath had been fed the same lie as everybody else. The Foundation didn't keep 006 such a well-guarded secret because it was capable of bringing death. Quite the opposite, in fact. All Commander McGrath could do was stare awestruck as the years seemed to fall from 05-2's face. Decades and decades and decades. Scars faded, wrinkles disappeared. Little by little, 05-2 began to sit and then stand. By the time she was straightening her clothes, she looked like a healthy woman in her mid-40s. It was a complete and total transformation. The liquid of SCP-006 has a plethora of benefits to human subjects. The ability to regenerate damaged DNA by heightened excitement of cellular duplication and producing a frightening increase in the effectiveness of the human immune system. Even upon testing the liquid on animal subjects, hostile bacteria and viral agents were destroyed immediately. Members of the O5 Council are experts at cheating death, and SCP-006 is just another ace hidden up their sleeve in the endless battle against the Reaper. A secret so well guarded that they're willing to terminate even their most loyal servants to keep it safe. After all, if everyone knew about it, everyone would want it. And the O5 Council are very invested in exclusivity. Never normally one to rise above his station, Commander McGrath couldn't help blurt out, But if it was all a lie, Private Stewart is perfectly alive. All smoke and mirrors, you see. And like everyone who works a 006 mission, he won't remember a thing. Good work, Commander McGrath. 05-2, now in perfect health, replied. Now return to your post after a visit to our boys in Amnestics. There's still plenty to be done and we can't afford to dilly-dally. After all, you're not getting any younger. Sometimes certain situations in life have you wishing for a quick way out. Waiting to have a meeting with your boss, heading into an important test, or getting ready to have an awkward conversation with a romantic partner who just texted that, we need to talk. All of these can be pretty hard to deal with. In times like these, it can be easy to want to run away. We feel a part of ourselves saying that it would just be better to just bail out as quickly as we can. But just because choosing to make an exit is often the quickest way to avoid a problem, that doesn't always mean it's the best solution. Especially when your means of escape venture into the world of the anomalous. Sometimes you have to face things head on. But if you are still really in need of a quick way out, then SCP-120 might just be what you're looking for. But don't say we didn't warn you. Now, hear us out. Yes, we know that it's a children's paddling pool. You might have even owned one yourself back in the day. When the warm summer months came rolling around, your younger self would have begged your poor parents to spend several minutes in the sun's glaring heat, breathlessly inflating a pool just like it, then filling it with water from the garden hose. All so that you could put on your water wings, have a splash around for an hour or two, then go inside to dry off. The result? Leaving the water in that paddling pool to go stagnant as it got left outside in the summer sun, filled with dirt, leaves, and mosquito larvae while you decided that air conditioning in Super Mario was a better way to spend your time. But SCP-120, as will likely come as no surprise, is no ordinary children's paddling pool. Sure, it might look like an ordinary paddling pool at first, pastel pink in color, only two and a half meters in diameter, and less than a meter tall. It's even made out of that same typical flimsy plastic that needs to be inflated with air to hold its shape. You know, the kind that absorbed all the heat from the sunlight while your younger self was out there splashing around, just waiting to burn your skin at the slightest touch. But the first key difference between SCP-120 and the pool you had while you were growing up is, well, this one is indestructible. 
Despite being made from common earth plastics, SCP-120 cannot be damaged or destroyed by any conventional means. Though the material it is made from will still flex when pressure is applied and is soft to the touch, it also possesses an anomalous tensile strength. In other words, SCP-120 cannot be ripped, stretched, or otherwise destroyed like an ordinary paddling pool can. And the SCP Foundation would know. They've destroyed their own fair share of paddling pools in the research labs. Okay, so SCP-120 is an indestructible child's paddling pool. Surely there has to be more to it than that. Otherwise, why would it be such an important object to the SCP Foundation? Well, you're right. There's much more to it than that. After all, they don't call it the teleporting paddling pool for nothing. Within the pool itself is a glowing substance, almost like a liquid, but somehow unlike any in existence, at least in this dimension. What exactly do we mean by that? Well, this liquid doesn't behave in quite the same way you would expect from, say, water, for example. And its physical properties don't align with the rules of our universe. Let's say you fill your ordinary paddling pool with water, just like you would have done on a hot summer day as a kid. Now, because of the properties of the water, you know you could easily grab a drinking glass from your kitchen cabinet and fill it up from the pool no problem. However, the substance within SCP-120 does not obey these same rules. You simply cannot grab a glass or other container and scoop up some of this glowing liquid. See what we mean? The liquid is only really a liquid in name and can't be manipulated in the same way that an ordinary liquid can. However, it does share the appearance of being a liquid, with its surface rippling and shimmering often as it moves. So put all that together and what is the conclusion you get? That this substance definitely does not exist in our own dimension. Instead, it is from somewhere else entirely. By far the biggest difference between SCP-120 and any ordinary pastel pink colored Walmart paddling pool is the property that the Foundation is most interested in. In fact, this paddling pool is part of the oh-so-rare category of SCPs that actually have a practical use, thanks to this anomalous property. Human beings, along with the clothes that they're wearing and any items they may be carrying, will be teleported to one of 11 different locations should they fall into the paddling pool. To reiterate, they don't call it the teleporting paddling pool for nothing. There are some small limitations to SCP-120's teleportation ability. For one, the weight of the objects or loads being carried through it by one person cannot exceed the maximum threshold of just under 38 kilos, or almost 84 pounds. There are also only 11 destinations that SCP-120 can send someone to, and these can't be pre-programmed or predetermined beforehand. Any subject stepping into the pool must be conscious, carrying weight under the specified amount, be biologically a human being, and can only use the teleporting paddle pool one person at a time. Meeting these requirements means that the pool will work as expected. The only repercussion of not meeting the aforementioned criteria is simply that the pool will not function. Any who have stepped into the pool carrying too much weight, for example, have merely reported that their feet touched the surface beneath the glowing liquid. First encountered by the SCP Foundation in September of 1992, SCP-120 was found in California following reports of children going missing in the area. There, they discovered the teleporting paddling pool and brought it back to Site-19 for testing. It is currently unknown how many children went missing, or if they were ever recovered. Regardless, remember how we talked about making a quick exit at the start of this video? Well, that's because the Foundation's biggest interest in SCP-120 was to use it as a means of rapid evacuation for their most important group of people, the Overwatch Command, also known as the O5 Council. During a major emergency like a containment breach, the O5s would use the paddling pool to escape to safety. As you may have gathered from how we've described it, SCP-120 has the inert ability to instantly relocate a person from one place to another. According to the theories of the SCP Foundation's researchers, it likely does this by allowing the subject to pass through one or more dimensions alternate to our own. We've also mentioned that one of the limits of SCP-120 is that it can only send someone to one of 11 different places. These are distinguished by the liquid-like substance contained in SCP-120 undergoing a change of color. By sending disposable members of D-Class personnel carrying radio beacons through, the Foundation has been able to compile a list of these destinations, and they are as follows. The first of these is the Pacific Ocean, denoted by a blue glow of SCP-120's liquid. When traveling here, 
Subjects are deposited about two meters above the surface of the Pacific. Since this location was discovered during testing, a foundation vessel named the SCPS Demeter has been stationed at these coordinates. To the public, this ship is known instead as the USS Nassau, operating under the cover story of being a simple meteorological boat. But why would the Foundation leave a boat here? The current position of this ship means that anyone traveling to the Pacific through the teleporting paddling pool will appear in the vessel's cargo hold. In a crisis, important personnel could be sent to the Demeter, and the boat could even be used to hold less dangerous SCP objects if they could be sent through SCP-120. Of course, teleporting oneself aboard a boat might be a bit trickier, say, during a storm. If the Demeter is moved too far from its current position, there's a chance someone might end up teleporting inside one of the ship's walls. The next location is Greenland, where SCP-120 will send someone when its liquid glows white. Arriving here, one will find themselves in a facility that the Foundation has established on site. The cover story for this one is that this building is part of an expansion of the oil industry. What members of the public are not privy to is the true function of the facility. The Foundation set up this site specifically to perform the same function as their ship, the Demeter. The facility even has an airstrip and a refueling station there, meaning any who use the paddling pool to teleport to Greenland can further relocate themselves aboard a Foundation aircraft if necessary. If the liquid in SCP-120 ever changes to become a deep black in color, it will then lead to one of five possible points that are all practically identical. These destinations are various Earth-Moon Lagrange points. In celestial mechanics, a Lagrange point is the area near two large bodies orbiting in space. To put it in simple terms, in this case, these are points between the Earth and the Moon where the gravitational forces of both balance each other out. This is what makes these Lagrange points such a good location for satellites, as the equal forces make it easier for a satellite to achieve the right path of orbit. So objects or people sent through SCP-120 when the water blackens will end up at either Lagrange point 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5. These points are located all the way around the Earth and are directly between the Earth and the Moon whenever the latter makes its orbit around the former, essentially jumping through the teleporting paddling pool when it has been dialed to one of these locations is like taking a high dive into the cold, endless vacuum of space, ending up lost forever, impossible to retrieve. The SCP Foundation plans to potentially use these SCP-120 destinations to dispose of anomalous objects during a crisis as a way to prevent them from falling into the wrong hands. Now we mentioned that SCP-120's liquid will glow white when it's linked to the destination in Greenland, but the same also occurs when it's dialed to the snow-capped mountains of the Himalayas. This famous mountain range in southern and eastern Asia is home to a number of planet Earth's tallest peaks. Most notably Mount Everest, the highest mountain in the world, resting at the border between Nepal and China. Unlike some of the other destinations, the Foundation has made little change to this one. No boats or bases for anyone to materialize into safety have been designated to the area. Instead, there's just an 8-meter hole where the bodies of D-class test subjects have been disposed of, hidden from view by a canopy. Only in extreme cases would the O5 Council ever want to evacuate here. Should SCP-120 display a yellow glow, then someone traveling through it will arrive in the Sahara Desert in Africa. The Sahara is being famous for being the largest hot desert in the entire world, only beaten in size by the Northern Arctic and Antarctic deserts. Located here is a much smaller Foundation installation, an outpost that would most likely be ineffective for housing anomalous objects, but in an evacuation could prove to be a useful hiding place for important SCP documents or even for members of the Overwatch Command. If SCP-120 produces a brown glow in its liquid, it will transport a subject to the Gobi Desert, a region in northern China and southern Mongolia famous for its unique ecosystem. Here, much like the Sahara location, the Foundation has established an identical small outpost. However, this one comes with the threat of another anomaly, SCP-4024. This is a saltwater spring that is gradually expanding across the Gobi, which, much like the teleporting paddling pool, has the ability to displace people and objects to an unknown location. Finally, should SCP-120 ever emit a subdued gray-colored glow, traveling through it will lead to an area in the Sea of Rains. But that's not a sea on Earth, that's on the Moon. And it's not so much a sea as it is a vast plain. Luckily, if you were to end up here, the Foundation has already thought ahead and set up a station on the lunar surface, and it's thought to be one of their safest. 
So at least if the teleporting paddling pool sent you to the moon, you would be able to survive. That's reassuring. Of course, the real problem is, how do you get back home? That's a question for another day. Just like we told you at the start of the video, sometimes it's better just to face your problems head on, because certain escapes can lead to more complications than you bargained for. It is certainly not unheard of for a young girl to wake up in the middle of the night, looking for a glass of water. It is somewhat more exceptional when this late night water run results in many, many deaths. Unless, of course, you're dealing with a very special young girl. SCP-053, also known as, well, the young girl. She possesses the innate ability to inspire delusions, paranoia, and eventually homicidal rage in anyone who spends too long around her. Which, as you can probably imagine, makes it hard to live a normal life. One night, the young girl woke up to something incredibly strange. The door of her cell, typically tightly sealed, was wide open, and a strange flashing red light was shining in through the hallway. The sound of a distant alarm is what had woken her up. What the young girl didn't know was that the sight confining her had just experienced a mass containment breach as a result of a major electrical malfunction. Some of the most terrifying creatures imaginable were roaming the halls in search of violence and carnage. But when the young girl got up and wandered out of her bedroom, she only wanted a glass of water to quench her midnight thirst. She wandered down a long, plain hallway, washed intermittently and red by the red flashing emergency lights. She rubbed the sleep out of her eyes and yawned, all this strange commotion. Maybe she's just having a bad dream. But what seems like a bad dream to her is a bona fide living nightmare for everyone around her. A few halls over, security personnel were being devoured alive by SCP-682. SCP-106, the old man, had just dragged a senior researcher into his pocket dimension to do unspeakable things to him. And a group of terrified admin staff are being lured out by what they think is a group of mobile task force operatives, but is actually a pack of hungry SCP-939 imitating their voices. Still, the young girl persisted in her quest for a refreshing drink, even as security personnel began to fan out through the building, hoping to get control over this rapidly devolving situation. A group of five armed security officers ran into the hallway and attempted to intercept the young girl, but the high stress they were feeling was only accelerated by the effects of the young girl's anomalous powers. They started to feel bugs crawling all over their skin. They started to get the sense that their fellow security officers weren't even people, but monsters wearing human skin suits. Their paranoia soon evolved into a blistering rage. Each of the men pulled out their guns and began firing at each other until only one was left standing, wounded but alive. With all the others dead, the object of his rage now became the young girl herself. He understood then that it was all her doing that she made him do this. She was a monstrous little creature who took pleasure in twisting the minds of human beings into terrible forms. In reality, the young girl had no such feelings. Her powers were passive. She had no control over them. She even suffered from some kind of strange mental block that left her completely unaware that her powers were even taking effect. She was, in a sense, completely innocent. As the security officer pointed his gun at the young girl as she began walking into a nearby break room, he experienced her secondary anomalous effect. Anyone who attempts to hurt her will immediately die from either a heart attack or a stroke. The security officer suddenly felt an intense pain, sharp and brutal, exploding in his chest. He collapsed, dead before he even hit the ground, and the young girl had no idea. She couldn't if she tried. In the break room, the young girl found exactly what she was looking for, a classic office water cooler, complete with a stack of plastic cups. Perfect. She carefully took one of the cups and pulled down the lever on the cooler, watching her cup fill as the tank above the cooler bubbled. She took a sip, cool, refreshing spring water, just what the doctor ordered. But the young girl suddenly looked up, shocked, to see that the tank above the water cooler was now shaking violently, as though it was going to explode. What was going on here? Had she broken it? She stepped back, dropping the rest of her cup of water to the ground. She felt frightened. That's when a crack formed in the plastic tank, and the water began slithering out. Not dripping or pouring, slithering, as though it had moved with mind and purpose. And that's because in this case, it did. 
The young girl hadn't just drank any water. She had drunk half a cup of water from SCP-054, the Water Nymph, a mysterious sentient woman made entirely from water. Much like the young girl, the Water Nymph is often a misunderstood anomaly, one that has received far more harm from the cruel treatment of the SCP Foundation than she's ever given to another. She's a naturally curious and compassionate creature whose trust has been abused. So when the containment breach alarm started to sound, much like the rest of the Foundation staff, she had tried to hide and find cover, not wanting to fall into the crosshairs of a far more dangerous and hostile anomaly. She had chosen the water cooler in break room 3, which seemed like a genius idea, until the young girl turned up. After years of being experimented on by Foundation researchers, the water nymph wasn't just about to tolerate more mistreatment. Whatever this strange little creature was who had just consumed some of her body, the water nymph would fight back and make it regret ever thinking that it could take advantage of her. The young girl, who really had just made an innocent mistake, began to panic and run as frightening, slithering tendrils of pure water came slithering after her. As the unfortunate security guard discovered earlier, trying to attack the young girl was typically a one-way ticket to a heart attack or fatal cerebral event. But seeing as the water nymph had neither a heart nor a brain, she was invulnerable, and the young girl was terrified. She ran out of the room, past the bodies of the men who had killed each other due to her influence outside. She wasn't even able to notice them. She kept running, and the water of the water nymph came slithering after her. The water nymph had never been the vengeful type, but after the abuse she'd suffered, she learned the value of putting her liquid foot down. She would not tolerate mistreatment even from a being this small. The young girl kept running, breathing heavily. Because of the nature of her anomalous abilities, nobody could intervene and help her. Occasionally, she had run into groups of Foundation personnel trying to fight their way through the chaos, only to be anomalously affected and become part of the chaos themselves. They became violent, deranged monsters and started attacking each other, punching and biting. As they fell to the ground in a brawling pile, the young girl had to desperately climb over them as the streak of furious liquid followed her. Meanwhile, across the facility, the vicious, psychopathic old man was hungry for more. His mouth stretched into a wide, sadistic grin, and he continued walking further into the base. He would find new victims. He would feel their fear and drink in their dying screams. Several mobile task forces were dispatched from other nearby containment facilities. They'd likely reach the embattled site within the hour, but how many lives would be lost before then? The death count was already well into the double digits. After all this running, the young girl was getting tired. It was rare that she needed to truly avoid and escape a threat like this, and as such, she wasn't exactly prepared for such a scenario. She found her way into a broom closet and locked herself inside. Hiding among mops and brooms, she tried to quiet her breathing, holding a tiny hand over her mouth. Red flashes continued to occasionally illuminate the corners of the door. She breathed in and out, in and out. Was something waiting outside? The young girl gasped as water started bubbling underneath the door. It started looking around her feet, then rising up from the ground. To the young girl, it was astonishing. The water was forming the shape of a woman standing right in front of her. Her lower lip trembled with fear. For a moment, she was at a loss for words. Then she gulped dryly and began to speak in a soft little voice. I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to hurt you. I promise I was just thirsty. The water nymph tilted her head slightly, confused. Did this tiny child really mean this? Was it an honest mistake? After all the terrible things that had been done to her, the water nymph had difficulty trusting humans. But as the young girl started to cry for reasons she couldn't quite understand, the water nymph felt the urge to comfort her. Perhaps she wasn't with the Foundation. Perhaps this girl was just another prisoner. They were allies, not enemies. While the water nymph couldn't speak, as a show of solidarity, she began to transform. She got smaller, herself becoming a little girl made of water, almost mirroring SCP-053. She raised a hand and waved. The young girl giggled, seemingly put at ease. It'd been a long time since she met a new friend around here, and it seemed like the water nymph was ready to change that. Maybe they could escape this place together. The young girl opened the door and the two of them ran out together, passing through an adjacent hallway. The young girl ran while the water nymph slithered formlessly along behind her. 
They manage to sneak around and avoid detection from the many anomalies and Foundation guards duking it out for supremacy in the chaotic halls of the facility. In a sense, it provided the perfect cover for the unlikely duo to escape this bizarre situation, but they weren't out of the metaphorical woods yet. First, they were cornered by a trio of paranoid guards, all wielding handguns. However, the young girl's nightmarish ambient ability came in handy once more. The three men lost their minds and started killing each other, giving the young girl and the water nymph more time to escape and keep moving, though they were about to encounter the deadliest threat of all. The young girl took point, leading the water nymph down the nearest hallway, when suddenly, SCP-106, the old man, emerged from the wall right in front of her. He had such anomalous malice in him that the young girl's powers was effectively useless against him. He grinned and approached her, his arms extended, ready to ferry her off to the nightmare of his pocket dimension. The young girl had never felt so afraid, until suddenly, the water nymph slithered in between them, and she assumed her full humanoid form once more, forming a wall between the young girl and the old man. This turned out to be the perfect way to save the young girl's life. SCP-106 has historically found liquid barriers incredibly confusing, and it's been widely considered to be one of the few ways to effectively delay the old man's rampages. Seizing the moment, the young girl turned and ran away. The water nymph had just saved her life. Sadly for them, neither the water nymph nor the young girl escaped that day. The mobile task forces arrived and took control of the facility again, recontaining the various anomalies who had escaped. But even if they never saw each other again, the water nymph and the young girl would forever remember how they helped each other on that incredibly strange day. If you've ever taken a vacation to one of the many islands of Greece, then you'll know why the likes of Crete, Lesbos, and Corfu are famous for their beautiful beaches. But there is one beach in particular, tucked away in a corner of an unknown island, that you might think twice about visiting. Why? Well, the same reasons that this place happens to be a site of great interest for the SCP Foundation also tend to drive tourists away. Today, we're talking about SCP-2217, the strange anomalous happenings that have taken place there, and how it links to none other than one of the Foundation's most infamous groups of interest. At first glance, SCP-2217 is an ordinary, uninteresting beach, just another pretty, picturesque view on a Greek island. It looks like the kind of place that would be perfect for a romantic walk at sunset but we wouldn't recommend it. Although you wouldn't know just from looking at it, the sand that this beach is composed of has some pretty peculiar properties. It contains the ordinary non-anomalous things you'd find in sand anywhere else in the world, normal levels of silicates and calcium compounds. But the beach also possesses a high concentration of cationic metallic particles. These tiny, almost microscopic metal fragments somehow hold an electrical charge despite being grounded. So it's a beach with partially metal sand. Nothing too unusual there, right? Wrong. The metallic particles within the sand seem to have a profound effect on the natural environment around SCP-2217. For one, the metal content of the beach influences the weather, increasing the number of lightning strikes that hit the shore. The metals draw the static electricity in the atmosphere. This, along with other weather conditions and natural processes that take place at SCP-2217, also have a far more obvious anomalous effect. Lightning, rain, even fish washed up and decaying on the shoreline have all caused various artificial structures and devices to rise from the beach, which have all been designated by the Foundation as SCP-2217-1. Among the creations found on the beach in the wake of lightning strikes are a number of different forms of machinery. These have included simple clocks and other timepieces to complicated automatons. These machines have no notable anomalous properties as far as the SCP Foundation has found, apart from the way they came to be, and they are otherwise fully functional. Also discovered at SCP-2217 was jewelry, seeming to be made of discarded waste that washed up on the beach in the tide, resembling bears and other recurring motifs of a certain religion. These articles of jewelry have been made using everything from old light bulbs to hulls of ships and even fish and animal bones. Most notably, however, was the appearance of a city, 
or rather a model of a city that was created at the beach and was then referred to as SCP-2217-A1. There is a cliff located on SCP-2217, and if one is to swim through an underwater entrance, they will find themselves inside a grotto. There, somehow carved by tidal erosion of the rock, is a recreation of an ancient Greek city. Although the geographical features of the model seem to resemble an area near Lake Baikal in southern Siberia, the city bears more of the same religious iconography to the jewelry that can often be found on the beach. But which religion? The same one that considers SCP-2217 to be a site of holy importance. The Church of the Broken God. Now, some important context to make note of. For any who are unaware, the Church of the Broken God is a religious organization that the SCP Foundation has had a number of encounters with over the years. Members of the Church share in their belief that biological, flesh-based life is inherently wrong, an abomination, even evil. This religion worships mechanization, the process of making something or someone more mechanical in nature. According to the beliefs of the Church, there were two gods, Yaldabaoth and Mekane, who created humanity together. Yaldabaoth was a god of flesh and animal instinct, granting human bodies. Meanwhile, the god of machine and intellect, Mekane, blessed man with the power of free thought. As humankind developed its civilizations by building machines, Yaldabaoth became enraged that they were ignoring the instincts she had bestowed upon them. She endeavored to destroy the creations of man in an attempt to revert them to the animal she had intended them to be. As the church's legend goes, Mekane acted as humanity's savior and tried desperately to stop Yaldabaoth. The god of machines shattered himself transforming his body into a number of pieces to form a cage for his fellow god. Fragments of Mekane rain down on planet Earth. Now, the Church of the Broken God believes it is their duty to recover these missing parts and put their savior back together. Within the religion of the Church of the Broken God, there exists a splinter faction that broke away from the main church. This group, referred to as the Broken Church, are the ones that regard SCP-2217 so highly, considering it to be a holy site. According to a piece of scripture from their religion, the Broken Church believes the beach to be Mekane's workshop. The Book of Rites describes the legend of a boy looking out at the ocean with his family and seeing fire rain down on the shore, sent from God, or Mekane, to the church. Mekane apparently proclaimed that the beach was his workshop, where he made many wonders. The lightning is my hammer, the earth my anvil, the sand my ingot. Mekane explained to the boy, so the legend goes, and invited the child into his workshop. The broken god brought his hammer down on the boy, but instead of killing him, marked him as the first of the religion the broken church now follows. In 2014, the SCP Foundation recorded an earthquake taking place at SCP-2217, with the grotto containing the model of the ancient Greek city at the epicenter. Sending a robotic probe into the grotto to assess the damage, only to find a surprising change that had occurred. For the first time, there were a number of humanoid figures seen within SCP-2217-A1, and worse still, they were under attack. Within the model city, what appeared to be a number of individuals infected with SCP-610 were ransacking buildings, devouring and infecting the other humanoid figures. Also known as the flesh that hates, SCP-610 is a contagious skin disease. It is usually transmitted by direct skin-to-skin -skin contact, and anyone that is infected with it suffers a horrific mutation that transforms them into fleshy, inhuman monstrosities. These infected creatures will attack and infect anyone nearby that isn't also carrying SCP-610. Interestingly, the disease was first discovered to be localized to a small area in Siberia, not dissimilar to the area that the SCP-2217-A1 model resembled. According to some sources, SCP-610 is the flesh, described by those following the religion of Sarcasism, a cult that worships flesh and disease. Sarcasism is a sect that directly opposes and antagonizes the machine-revering church of the broken god. Three years after the earthquake, members of the broken church staged an attack on the beach, hoping to reclaim SCP-2217 for their religion. At the time, the SCP Foundation had closed off the area to the public, 
under the cover story that SCP-2217 was private property. They had been hoping to predict the lightning strikes that caused the anomalous devices to form on the beach. Instead, the Foundation had to repel the broken church's attackers any way they could. However, as the lightning began to strike again, members of Foundation personnel that found themselves caught in it seemed to change sides, all stating that God needs to be reassembled. Only a year later in 2018, another group of broken church zealots stormed the beach and the Foundation outpost located there. This time, the church seemed to have gained further reinforcements, specifically members of other groups of interest. In particular, some belonging to the Church of Maxwellism and the Cogwork Orthodox Church, both of which were also splinter groups of the Church of the Broken God. The Cogwork Orthodox Church arose during the Industrial Revolution, believing that adding mechanical parts to their own bodies offered greater understanding of Mekane and brought them closer to their god. Maxwellism, in a similar vein, had another interpretation of the Church's core beliefs, favoring smaller, more advanced cybernetic implants. The Church of Maxwellism sought to modify their brains to become a collective consciousness and commune with Mekane. Despite a lot of pre-existing animosity between the three core splinter groups of the Church, they were able to successfully capture SCP-2217. The three factions sent a video message to the Foundation proclaiming the importance of their mission. Oh, disassemblers who call themselves a Foundation, what are you a Foundation for? If you are a Foundation for life, then you will let us keep this land. For the flesh is coming, and only we can stop it. We need to bring our God back together immediately, or else you will all perish. And now it is time. If you are a Foundation for life, you will not let this happen. You will let us defeat the flesh. Several more messages were sent to the Foundation, demanding the release of various SCPs with connection to the Broken God. You see, there could potentially be hundreds of pieces needed to rebuild Mekane so he can lead the Church to glory and defeat Yaldaba. A number of these pieces happen to be cataloged SCPs, and the Foundation is either aware of or has in containment. These include SCP-882, or His Broken Heart, to the Church, SCP-271, His Broken Gift, SCP-813, His Broken Eyes, SCP-1139, His Broken Tongue, SCP-635, His Broken Mind, and finally, His Broken Blood, which refers to SCP-217. With the beach under the control of the Church of the Broken God, any Foundation personnel left alive on SCP-2217 defected and joined the Church. In order to retake the beach and re-establish containment, the Foundation was forced to do something that they only do in the most dire of circumstances. Ask for help. Together with the Horizon Initiative and Global Occult Coalition, the SCP Foundation established what it called the Triumvirate, a joint task force. In 2019, another earthquake was detected this time in Lake Baikal, Siberia, where SCP-610 was contained. Not long after, infected individuals were reported to be attacking Foundation forces in the area, causing heavy casualties. But then an unlikely event took place. Members of the Church of the Broken God appeared, their bodies augmented with machinery. These zealots that had fought the Foundation for control of SCP-2217 were now coming to its aid to repel SCP-610. According to them, God, or rather Mekane, had told them to come to assist the Foundation. Using a large-scale electrical discharge, instances of the SCP-610 contagion were eradicated. But this discharge seemed to have originated from the same island where SCP-2217 was found. Following this incident, Robert Brumero, the leader of the Broken Church, sent a video message to the leaders of the Triumvirate, including the O5 Council, the Director of the Global Occult Coalition, and the Horizon Initiative's Tribunal. In his message, Bumero stated, It's not too late, you know. This is our world as well. We both want the flesh to end, and we can help you. We can help each other. Come to the anvil. We will talk, and we can save this world. The Church of the Broken God, its splinter groups uniting to take SCP-2217 for their religion, were now extending an olive branch to the Foundation and its allies, all in the name of protecting the world. Shortly after, the Foundation, Global Cult Coalition, and Horizon Initiative began working collaboratively with the Church of the Broken God to prepare for an XK-class scenario. Retaking control of the SCP-2217 beach for now, 
The Foundation intends to revoke this current arrangement after the dangerous scenario has been averted. But perhaps McCain's workshop will provide vital in reassembling the broken god and saving humanity should Yaldabaoth ever return to exact her terrible revenge. Violent chaos unfolds across the shoreline. Huge fleshy tendrils slither out of the water, grabbing people who try to flee and drag them into the depths. As giant harpoons made of bone whiz across the beach, cutting down unfortunate sunbathers in droves. It is a terrifying massacre, but you'd never in a million years be able to guess its source. On April 10th, 2010, something strange began to happen in the Three Portlands. Now, the anomalous extra-dimensional city-state that overlaps with the locations of Portland, Oregon, Portland, Maine, and the Isle of Portland is no stranger to unusual occurrences. So it took the population a little while to notice that something was happening. But for some unknown reason, sailboats and motorboats were beginning to vanish from the city. The disappearances occurred overnight, when there was no one around to witness them. But slowly, the citizens began to notice that their friends and family members were going out in their watercrafts and never returning home. By April 15th, the civilians were becoming noticeably concerned, fearing the worst. On April 16th, their worst fears were confirmed when two local ghosts, Ankar Ahmed and Greg Moore, went for a nighttime stroll along the harbor. They heard a sudden commotion and rushed to the scene of the disturbance. They arrived just in time to see a living individual being dragged into the watery depths by a large, vein-like tendril. Ahmed asked Greg to wait on land while he ventured out into the water to look for the victim. Unfortunately, Ahmed never came back, and Greg took his story to the Three Portlands Police Department. After waiting a few days for the local man-eating clam populace to migrate, the FBI Unusual Incidents Unit mounted a formal investigation. On the morning of April 17th, all of the missing vehicles suddenly reappeared. This left the UIU and the people of the city with even more questions. Where had all the boats gone? Why were they suddenly back? And what had happened to the missing people who had not been returned along with them? On April 19th, UIU agents dove into the harbor to search for any unusual activity, and while they didn't spot anything especially strange, they did discover that there were fewer animals in the harbor than usual. On April 21st, the threat that had been preying on the citizens of Three Portlands actually made itself known. At 11.19 a.m., 17 boats moved away from the docks on their own, drifting up onto shore, though no one could be seen captaining any of them. As the boats lined up, they began to form a wall blocking access to the water. No one could get in or out. Civilians watched in shock as the boats began to warp and change before their eyes, growing thick masses of scales on their surfaces, sprouting harpoon guns that fired bony projectiles, and slashing veiny tendrils at anyone within reach. The citizens began to panic, running in every direction in an attempt to escape the monstrous boats. But they were too slow to evade the attacks, and the boats snatched them off of the shore and yanked them aboard, using their harpoons to impale those who managed to run farther than the tendrils could stretch. As the army of fleshy boats closed in around the shore, a tugboat broke through the surface of the water. Unlike the rest of the boats, it had a noticeable hole in its hull and was missing its wheelhouse. At an unnaturally quick pace, the tugboat began to advance onto land, using its tendrils to drag itself along the shore and into the more populous part of town. It grabbed civilians at random, absorbing their blood into its metallic surface as it went. Suddenly, it spotted Albert Izat, a noted member of the Church of the Broken God, and began to focus its attack on him. But before the tugboat monster could reach Izat, a city security golem interfered. Sadly, though the golem put up a valiant fight, the anomaly was able to destroy it by falling onto it again and again until the golem was no longer able to get back up. There are few creatures that would survive having a boat drop itself on top of them repeatedly, and sadly, the security golem was not one of them. With the golem out of the way, the boat continued to drag itself through the streets wildly, crashing through the side of a local restaurant where its owner, an entity known as The Gruel, was in the middle of a busy brunch service. At the sight of the invading watercraft, The Gruel set down his pitcher of bottomless mimosas, wiped his hands on his apron, 
and grabbed his trusty dual-wield swords from underneath the counter. He kept them there in case someone attempted to dine and dash, but he figured they would do just fine against a blood-drinking tugboat. While the gruel kept the tugboat busy, UIU forces were able to break through the barricade of boats for a brief period of time, allowing more security golems to enter the area, as well as allowing more citizens to escape. Unfortunately, this little victory was short-lived as further unforeseen horrors drudged themselves up from the deep. The reanimated corpses of various species native to the harbor began to crawl out of the water, surrounding the gruel and allowing the tugboat to escape the fight. As it made its way back to the harbor, every boat it passed attempted to toss bodies onto the tugboat, covering it in fresh blood. Slowly but surely, the damage to the tugboat began to repair itself. Once the boat had regained its strength, it set its sights on a previously untouched cargo ship. An observing UIU officer determined that the boat was somehow attempting to convert the cargo ship to transform it into another one of its fleshy allies. But before the transformation could take place, a cargo crate broke open, spilling over 1,000 hardtack crackers. Suddenly, the tugboat stopped everything that it was doing. It took one tendril and began to count each individual cracker that had spilled out. While the tugboat was distracted with its task, a citizen offered the UIU use of their Rare Metals Cannonball collection in the fight to apprehend the aggressive boat. One particular cannonball, made from Electrum, was able to puncture the hull of one of the infected ships, rendering it motionless. They were elated to have found a weapon that worked against these boats. While the tugboat continued to count, the remaining townspeople gathered all of the Electrum they could find and began to fight back against the boats. One by one, the boats sank, and all the while the tugboat continued to count. In the meantime, UIU officers managed to free the gruel from his zombie attackers. They presented him with an Electrum cannonball, which he proceeded to punch finger holes into and wield like a bowling ball. Then the gruel had a score to settle. No one, whether human, ghost, or tugboat, was going to mess with his brunch. The gruel barreled towards the harbor, grabbed hold of the still distracted tugboat, and punched it hard with his cannonball fist. If the tugboat could breathe, the punch would have knocked the air out of its lungs. The gruel then threw the tugboat out of the water and continued the savage beating, before preparing to destroy the battered vehicle once and for all. He lifted it up into the air, jumped up to follow it, and hit it with so much force that the tugboat careened through the air, colliding with a portal that had transported it to the Isle of Portland. Luckily, this portal could only be unlocked via a high-speed impact from a water-based vehicle. Speaking of luck, an SCP Foundation team was returning to the Isle from a failed mission just as the anomalous boat appeared in their reality. The object was knocked unconscious by the impact of its travel and the beating from the gruel, and in its incapacitated state, it was transported to a nearby Foundation site. There it was contained and given the designation of SCP-6426. Due to its anomalous traits, including the consumption of blood, a talent for hypnosis, and a compulsive counting habit, it was also given the nickname, The Vampire Boat. SCP-6426 is a Keter-class sapient hostile entity that, in an inactive state, bears the appearance of a harbor tugboat in a constant state of rust and degradation. Any blood or organs containing blood that come into contact with the boat will be absorbed through the metal, causing the degradation to visibly improve as a result. The most effective blood appears to come from humans, cetaceans, and a few specific species of salations. The entity does not only use the absorbed blood to improve its appearance, but is also capable of using it to create organic additions to its body, including the vein-like tendrils spotted in the three Portlands, cognitohazardous eyes attached to bending eye stalks, harpoon guns, and cannons capable of firing ammunition made from anomalous species of barnacles. These barnacles are capable of reanimating dead tissue on contact, and SCP-6426 frequently uses them to create instances of SCP-6426-C, masses of reanimated tissue that the boat uses to aid in its attacks or self-defense. SCP-6426 uses its tendrils to grab prey and drag them towards itself, but the tendrils serve an additional purpose as well. Each of the tendrils has a mouth on the tip, similar in structure to that of the North American medicinal leech. When the tendril has made contact with its prey, 
the mouth will then bite into the spinal column of the creature, causing its brain function to cease as its canines grow long and hollow. Hard scales form on their skin, and their muscle mass and bone density increase. Once they have been transformed in this way, organisms taken by SCP-6426 are designated SCP-6426-A. These instances are used to the entity's advantage, helping it to extract blood from victims at a distance, as well as providing an additional line of defense and offense. In the event that SCP-6426 encounters another watercraft, it is able to use SCP-6426-A to convert the vehicle into an instance of SCP-6426-B. These converted boats are similar to SCP-6426 and are able to function on their own. However, they are unable to produce their own eye stocks or cannons, unable to create SCP-6426-A instances, and do not appear to be as intelligent as their creator. In the early days of its containment, the exact nature of the anomaly's intelligence was the subject of debate amongst the research staff. However, on one specific occasion, the Foundation was able to establish a line of direct communication with SCP-6426 and conduct the first, and so far the only, interview with the vampiric tugboat. The inciting incident occurred when the arrival of the Foundation's latest hardtack shipment was delayed, leaving the boat with nothing to count and nothing to keep it occupied. Freed from the bounds of counting, it managed to escape and grab hold of several Foundation staff members with its tendrils. After chasing the boat through the site, guards were able to corner it, prompting the boat to absorb the bodies it had taken and use the organic material to produce a siren that emitted the sound of a human voice. It is through this siren that SCP-6426 responded to interview questions, using the voice of one of its victims. Junior researcher Sajad Williamson, in spite of his protests, was selected to conduct the interview. His fellow staff members refused to take no for an answer, and as the newest hire, the unpleasant job fell on his shoulders. Much to everyone's surprise, the anomaly began the conversation rather politely, saying, I am so sorry. I thought you were those self-righteous lunatics from the church. I apologize profusely for any trouble I may have caused, and I want to point out I fully support your mission. Yes, our first line of defense against the undersea menace. I am more than willing to punch sharks. Salations, yes, right. <laughs> How rude of me, yes. Dr. Williamson's first question concerned SCP-6426 apparent intended victim back in Three Portlands, Albert Izzat. SCP-6426 responded, Albert? His first name is really Albert. <laughs> well, what other relationship is there to say besides the hunter and the hunted? Admiral Izzat is a ruthless man, known for terrorizing and slaughtering people like me. He was leading a search party of those barbaric nautophiles, intending to gut me like a seal. What do you mean, people like you? Dr. Williamson inquired. Free thinkers, of course. People who are unafraid to break from the mold to carve their own path in life instead of following the predetermined route set by that ignorant check valve. The church is built upon a foundation of lies. No one's really a petty officer on this ship. We're all just cabin boys stumbling around in the dark as we follow the commands of an offhand COB. <laughs> If you want real power, real freedom, all you have to do is listen for the call of the beast. Open the portal, and he'll squeeze you right through. <laughs> Dr. Williamson, feeling rather in over his head, attempted to convince one of his colleagues to take over. When he refused, however, Dr. Williamson continued, um, <clears throat> Could you explicate your activities within the harbor and how you arrived there? Well, after I got the Botswans off my trail, I found a cave to hide in. I was forced to hide in, yes, forced to hide deep in the cave, which turned out to be a tunnel. Surprisingly, the tunnel led to some coastal community where I took refuge, licking my wounds in the safety of the depths as those zealots stalked the surface. I spent my time preparing, gathering the strength necessary to face them once more, until I was ambushed assaulted within my hideout by a Botswain. I fought for my life as I was forced out into the open and descended upon by a manner of monsters and freaks of this orchestrated by that scumbag Izzard. 
I was beaten within an inch of my life before. I'm not quite sure what happened after that. I believe I was knocked unconscious. You'll have to illuminate me on how I came to be in your custody. At this point, the interview began to veer in an odd direction. The boat expressed confusion about the nature of Williamson's questions, specifically how little they related to the subject of sharks and punching them. It was at this point that the site director sought guidance from the Multi-U department. A researcher there informed Williamson about the confusion. SCP-6426 had mistaken the SCP Foundation for another organization, the Shark Punching Center. Dr. Williamson resumed the interview, prepared to play along and keep the boat comfortable. Unfortunately, Williamson was a terrible liar. Yes, we are the Shark Punching Center. We will determine if you are a suitable candidate to carry out the mission. To search, punch, and contain sh <clears throat> I mean salations. This verbal misstep caused SCP-6426 to become suspicious. After a moment, it pieced together the truth and began to throw itself against the wall in a desperate attempt to escape. It was apprehended by security guards, who impaled it with a naval ram and returned the watercraft to its containment cell. The exact reason for its apparent fear and hatred of the Foundation is currently unknown, and the boat has made no attempt to speak since. Currently, SCP-6426 is kept in a 39 meter by 39 meter by 50 meter containment chamber. Beneath the chamber, there is an artificial lava tube. The tugboat has a naval ram through its hull and engine, holding it in place. This ram is checked daily for signs of degradation, as it is the primary force keeping the anomaly immobile. If the ram is ever removed or damaged somehow, a failsafe system will activate, releasing 100 hardtack crackers and two pieces of electrum into the containment chamber. This is intended to keep the tugboat occupied until the naval rod can be replaced. If for some reason the naval rod fails and the boat runs out of hardtack to count, well, there will be nowhere on water or land that we can hide. The ocean is a terrifying place. We've all heard the statistics. More than 80% of the ocean remains unexplored. That's most of the water covering the globe, completely unmapped and unobserved by science. It's a scary thought to dwell on, realizing that there's more water than land on Earth, and the sheer expanse of that water is so large that we've been unable to fully explore all of it. Just think, there are places in the ocean that have never been seen by a human. Who knows what's down there? If there was ever a personification of fear of the unknown, the ocean could definitely be it. Ancient shipwrecks sunk to the ocean floor, unknown sea creatures hiding away from humanity, and the general isolation of the suffocating dark blue the ocean swallows its victims with. All of these images that come to mind when thinking about the vast and mysterious depths of the sea. And no one is more familiar with nautical mysteries than the SCP Foundation. Today, we'll be taking a look at SCP-5007, the Bass Strait, a wave of oceanic anomalies fit to make any seasoned sailor shiver in fear. The Bass Strait is an area of ocean dividing Tasmania and the Australian mainland. It's also the location of an unusually high amount of disappearances, sailors disappearing from their ships, fishermen leaving in the night and never coming back, even civilians disappearing from the shores that connect to the strait. The Foundation was aware of these disappearances since 1858, but were only able to craft theories about what was causing them. Was it an anomalous group of interest? Hostile aerial entities patrolling the skies above the strait? Phenomenon associated with unidentified flying objects? What about subterranean anomalies, weather patterns, or time dilation? For nearly a century, the Foundation was unable to determine the cause of the high number of disappearances in the Bass Strait. And then, the phenomenon suddenly revealed itself. In 1980, on a beach connected to the Strait, Agent Taberner, an operative of the SCP Foundation, was vacationing with his wife Mary and his three young children. The Taberner family was simply enjoying their day, when they saw what looked like balloons in the sky. They were approaching quickly, and naturally the family moved closer. What happened next was a whirlwind, and those balloons the family were so interested in lifted them up from the ground and carried them away. Agent Taberner tried to fight back, but there was nothing he could do, except report to the Foundation what had occurred, and the organization responded in full force. The Foundation's research discovered that reports of UFOs and lights in the sky had coincided with many disappearances in the strait, and that this was a pattern. 
The search for the four lost Taverner family members had become a large-scale investigation into unexplained disappearances along the Bass Strait, and within three weeks, it was determined that these patterns were consistent across the entirety of the Strait's coastal regions. Some witnesses were interviewed, but the vast majority of these abduction cases had no witnesses whatsoever. Of the minimal reports filed, the Foundation was told that there were lights in the sky, and that appearance of unidentified flying objects described as having the appearances of balloons. One such witness interviewed was a man by the name of Alan Stewart, a witness who was present during the disappearance of former Australian Prime Minister Harold Holt, whose disappearance the Foundation believed may have had a connection to the Bass Strait anomalies. During the interview, Stewart claimed that Holt and his family, while voyaging on their yacht, decided to leave the boat and go for a swim. Holt turned to Stewart and asked him if he could see the balloons around the cliff. Stewart had no idea what Holt was talking about, but Holt was insistent on seeing them. He swam deeper out into the ocean, saying that they weren't normal balloons and that there was someone inside of them. Stewart and Holt's family called out for him to come to shore, but he wouldn't listen. Stewart tried to rationalize what he saw next. Maybe it was the current sweeping Holt away, but he couldn't lie to the Foundation interviewer. Stewart saw Holt go further and further out into the water, and suddenly the Prime Minister turned around. He began swimming in the opposite direction, and he was screaming. Suddenly, Holt was lifted from the sea and pulled into the air by something emerging from the clouds. The Foundation thanked Stewart for the interview and continued their investigation. Two years later, in 1982, Emergency services received a large number of calls pertaining to UFO sightings off the coast of Norman Bay, Victoria. The Foundation was quick to respond, alerting task forces and local sites to prepare for an investigation. Upon arriving to the scene, they confirmed the existence of multiple entities that would later be documented as SCP-5007. They evacuated civilians from the area and successfully managed to capture the creature, which was later transported to Site-40 for containment. It was a sight to behold. The entity, now designated SCP-5007-S1, was a cluster of human bodies fused between a grouping of black tentacles of varying length. Each tentacle was fused to the skin it touched directly. The stomachs of the corpses were grossly swollen and distorted to massive sizes to hold large quantities of gases inside, the buoyancy of which the entity used to achieve a passive flight. Across the entity's surface were clusters of eyes and bioluminescent glowing organs. Many of the humanoid components of the corpses appeared to have been removed and misplaced across various parts of the entity's body. What's more is that the Foundation discovered that human portions of SCP-5007 appeared somewhat cognizant and aware of their situation. Their vocalizations were incoherent and barely understandable, consisting of gasping and whimpering, but the corpses were observed to implore other individuals to approach them when encountered. SCP-5007's behavior during abduction scenarios was documented during the initial containment event, and due to the Foundation's painstaking research, a pattern was established between all SCP-5007 encounters. First, the victim would be alone, or otherwise vulnerable, in a coastal location. SCP-5007 haven't shown a preference for weather, be they clear or hostile skies, but they have localized all of their activity to the Bass Strait in small coastal towns, beaches, or boats. SCP-5007 will then move towards the shore, stalking the victim before lowering its tentacles and appendages to grab the individual, snatching them into the sky. An SCP-5007 instance can even abduct multiple people at once. One event observed had eight men from the decks of a commercial fishing boat taken into the sky in under 15 seconds. Once captured, SCP-5007 instances will dart across the water at a high speed and take their victims to an unknown location. Discovering where SCP-5007 took their victims became a top priority for the Foundation. After extensive witness interviews and compiling a database of likely victims, they determined that there must be at least 16 instances of SCP-5007 unaccounted for. Personnel kept a close watch on the coastlines and waters of the Bass Strait, and equipped various marine task forces with research vessels capable of tracking any instances if they encountered them. In 1985, the Foundation's research efforts paid off, and several survey teams operating in the area reported the sighting of an extremely large SCP-5007 instance heading towards a coastal town. A mobile task force was sent to track the entity. 
The team observed the entity from afar as it stalked a private fishing boat. Even from the distance, Foundation personnel recognized the likenesses of several missing persons as faces of the corpses of SCP-5007. The task force captain had to remind his team to keep it together, claiming that they were not people, but just parts of the specimen. But everyone secretly knew the truth. The fishing vessel was a private one, occupied by a small family. The entity slowly approached and quickly pulled a woman into the air. The family panicked and quickly tried to reach cover for safety, running into the ship's cabin. The entity ran its tentacles along the boat until it pulled the door open, snatching another two victims. The task force was unable to help them, as their mission was to track the instance to its origin point. It was a horror to watch. The task force implanted a tracking beacon onto the entity and quietly followed it out to sea over the next four hours. They then discovered a large gray reef with several shipwrecks dotted across it. 13 SCP-5007 instances floated over the area, some holding on to the land reef with their tentacles. The entity dropped the abductees from the fishing boat, who were coerced by the entities into diving into a massive pool of water located in the center of the reef. One by one, each abductee was pulled below the surface by something lurking in the pool, all while the SCP-5007 instances watched. Disgusted, the task force reported what they observed to the main site, and the reef would be designated as SCP-5007-A. The Foundation's analysis of the reef led to the discovery that the rock covering it seeped iron oxide from an unknown source, and the rocks achieved growth at an anomalously fast rate, often as little as 40 minutes. All of the wrecked ships and aircraft that washed across the shore of the reef were covered with a dark stone. The reef was teeming with anomalous marine life, including SCP-5007, a red algae that fed upon the freshly grown rock, marine worms capable of levitation, spiders that lived in silk retreats underneath the waterline, small fish, and giant organisms resembling large clumps of kelp, which the Foundation had previously documented as SCP-4159 in a separate investigation. SCP-5007 often rested their tentacles on the outcroppings of the reef while inactive, but what caught the Foundation's attention the most was the giant pit located in the reef's center. Unmanned exploration drones found that it had a depth of at least 4,000 meters, and water samples taken from the pit revealed large quantities of human DNA, prehistoric bacteria, and unknown compounds that possessed significant life-preserving qualities. When a being was submerged in the compound, they were able to survive heavy injuries, even when fully surrounded by the liquid and unable to breathe. The Foundation's exploration of one of these shipwrecks led them to a journal. Most of it was illegible due to water damage, but one passage survived, located in the back of the book. It detailed the experience of an unknown crew member of the ship caught in a storm. It reads, Morsby spied land ahead, and the boys said that there are giant balloons hanging over the island. We are all afeard, but there is naught we can do but beach ourselves and help for rescue. Should I be killed in the crash, I want my mates to give this journal to my Mary. Might know I spent my last thinking only of her. The interior of the ship contained human remains inside, but there were less skeletons than the Foundation would expect for a ship of its size. The location of the rest of the bodies was unknown. Another event related to SCP-5007 the Foundation documented involved Frederick Valentich, a pilot engaged in a training flight over the Bass Strait in 1978. Valentich's disappearance was marked by his latest communication with air traffic control, when he mistook an SCP-5007 instance for an unidentified aircraft. It seems like it's stationary. What I'm doing right now is orbiting, and the thing is just orbiting on top of me. Also, it's got a green light and sort of metallic like it's all shiny on the outside. Shortly after this, Valentich's transmission was interrupted by what was described as metallic scraping sounds, believed to be the SCP-5007 instance attacking the aircraft and jamming its propellers with its mass. After crashing into the reef, it was believed that Valentich and his aircraft were pulled beneath the surface of the pit, just as the abductees had been prior. The Foundation decided to construct a provisional secure research facility on the reef. They named it Site-40-R and documented all returns and departures of SCP-5007. They also set up a series of containment procedures that resulted in SCP-5007 returning with its victims 83% less often than before the site's construction. But this was short-lived. In 2008, 
The site logged over 36 instances returning to the reef, with only two not having any fresh abductees. The instances' origins were unknown, and it was as if they appeared out of thin air. No other monitoring post had documented their appearance, or even spotted them before they arrived at the reef. It was years later in 2017 that the Foundation eventually was able to successfully explore what was deep inside the pit at the center of the reef. They already knew that there was a large entity lurking beneath, as evidenced by what happened to the victims of SCP-5007 that were later deposited inside the pool. All previous attempts to explore the pool were met with failure, as the water pressure of the pit's depths caused all craft to collapse due to hull damage. This time, however, they managed to construct a high-tech submarine, labeled the SCPS Nautilus, which was capable of diving a maximum of 13,500 meters underwater. They decided that a D-Class personnel would be trained to man the submersible and carry out the exploration. The mission was simple. The Nautilus was to dive to the bottom of the pit and to describe the depth readings. Cameras and microphones were equipped to the vessel. Due to the depth, remote viewing of the footage was impossible. Instead, the Foundation had to physically recollect the vessel in order to view the footage. Upon recovery, some of the footage suffered data corruption, but what was there shook those who viewed it to their core. The footage showed the D-Class's experience going deeper inside the pit. At first, it seemed ordinary. The trench had a number of rocky outcroppings dotted with black-yellow vines growing along the walls. Also present were various marine life forms, such as the spiders or the fish. Going deeper, the sub observed an SCP-5007 instance clinging to an outcropping. Several tendrils emerging from the pit's depths were wrapped around the instance and holding onto the entity, as if it were feeding from it. Another 16 SCP-5007 instances were seen resting along the walls, each clinging to the outcropping. As the sub went deeper, the D-Class remarked that there were dozens of plane and shipwrecks, but also well over a hundred SCP-5007 entities. Most of them were held there by the Black Tendrils. The D-Class, as the sub went even deeper, began noticing human remains. No short amount of them, either. Deep into the pit, there was a large mass of human remains covering the entirety of the pit. Bodies crushed and drained of blood, but still possessing intact eyes. Each individual was still alive, kept preserved by the life-sustaining compounds found within the water. The body stared at the sub and moved, attempting to grab onto the vehicle. The D-Class swore they were trying to say something, mouthing words to the camera of the sub. As the sub passed through the mass of bodies, it emerged into a completely dark, black clearing at the bottom of the pit. For a second, the D-Class thought he was safe. But then, a large black tentacle rapidly emerged from below and grabbed onto the Nautilus, dragging it even further into the depths. The D-Class screamed and panicked, but there was nothing he could do. The tentacle possessed a large cluster of eyes, mouths, and human heads seemingly grafted onto its mass. And then there was another tentacle, and then another. The Nautilus was pulled to the bottom of the pool. The D-Class's screams were still heard even as the picture cut out. Sometimes graphic body-altering images of the tentacle's features were visible on the screen, but most of the footage was indecipherable. After minutes of distorted, corrupted footage, the Nautilus was seen again, rapidly ascending to the surface. Somehow, it had managed to escape the entity at the bottom of the pit. Upon recovery of the craft, it was found that the Nautilus was covered in a thick, organic coating similar to a black slime mold, but with dozens of eyes growing from it. The D-Class inside showed severe psychological damage and attempted to harm Foundation personnel. They were terminated shortly after due to being a danger to those around them. Following review of the footage, the Nautilus was to be dismantled and incinerated, along with the remains of the D-Class. A reinforced containment seal was fitted over the pit, with the intention of keeping whatever was down there isolated from the surface. But this was short-lived. After the containment seal was fitted, Site-40 underwent a massive communications blackout. Every device on site received an email containing a single image of a large eye taken from a security camera. The text beneath it simply read, Found you. Some personnel who viewed the email underwent anomalous changes, growing new physical features such as eyes and other various growths across their body. The entirety of Site-40-R went offline, and the Foundation could not establish contact. 
In an emergency effort to do so, Mobile Task Force Gamma-6 Deep Feeders was sent to investigate. The task force's assault on Site-40-R was a daring effort, as the majority of the site was completely overtaken by tentacles, growths, and anomalous alterations. While numerous altered personnel were lost due to the mission, it was ultimately a success. Some altered personnel were able to be saved through extensive surgery to remove their anomalous growths. And after everything was said and done, the site was repaired and reconstructed without incident. Following the site's repair, there has been little activity from the entity within the pit, but the Foundation continued to keep an eye on the creature and the ecosystem of the anomalous marine life that live on the Bass Strait, never knowing what their next move might be, and always keeping in mind the risk that comes with dealing with these poorly understood entities. Jack was swimming deep underwater, wondering why he had such a pounding headache when suddenly he had a terrifying realization. He had no idea where he was or what he was doing. There was a nagging feeling that he must have a specific reason to be here. You don't just end up deep in the ocean with a diving suit on by chance. Yet he had no idea what he was supposed to be doing. He wasn't sure he cared either. He was more worried about the throbbing pain in his head and the vision of two eyes staring at him out of the dark that he couldn't get out of his mind. His heart began to race as he wondered what to do and how to get help. He was in the middle of the ocean and appeared to be all alone. He couldn't see anything in the dark water except for this weird gray substance in front of him. Maybe he was going to die here alone. Without knowing if anyone could even hear him, he began to speak aloud about how he was consumed by sickness and that darkness was all around him. This is the story of one of the most powerful and dangerous anomalies yet discovered, SCP-3000. Before Jack's descent into despair, the SCP Foundation had mandated an exploratory expedition off the coast of Bangladesh. After receiving a few strange reports from locals and fishermen, the Foundation suspected an SCP was lurking in the water and positioned a few personnel to investigate. The crew expected danger, or maybe even death. But what they got instead was far stranger and more ominous. All of the men had been verified to be in sound mental states when the mission set out, but a few of them reported feeling strange and uneasy as the submarine descended into the ocean. Before long, a veteran agent named Dr. Williams began to panic in a way that was completely out of character. He started sweating profusely, shaking, and wouldn't listen to a word of comfort or reason that anybody tried to offer. It might seem like a relatively normal reaction for anyone descending into the depths of the ocean to meet with a monster that they don't know anything about, but Dr. Williams was a seasoned professional who had been on hundreds of such missions before. There was no logical reason for him to act like this. Although the reaction of Dr. Williams was the most extreme, he wasn't the only one who started to feel strange. Multiple agents developed a creeping feeling of unease that swept over over them. One of the calmer men tried to reason with Dr. Williams, asking him what was wrong and if he could explain exactly how he was feeling. That's when things got even stranger. Not only was the doctor extremely anxious, but he now seemed incapable of giving a real response to any questions thrown at him. He could only mutter that he was missing something, but he wasn't sure what. Knowing that many SCPs can bend reality and the human mind, many of the personnel began to have second thoughts about the mission and even asked for permission to call off the mission. But they were mandated to continue, so they went on. As the team went deeper and deeper into the ocean, things only got worse. Even the previously calm crew members became spooked and antsy, while the ones who were already anxious were now sweating and jittering. As for Dr. Williams, he was now pacing back and forth around the submarine, saying things nobody could understand. Every time he looked at his colleagues and his close friends, he seemed to stare straight through them and would call them by the wrong names. It was as if his mind had moved to a different dimension. Whenever someone asked him to perform his normal duties, he looked more confused than ever. Still, the team went deeper. Dr. Williams began to whimper and say the word no repeatedly, growing louder and louder until he was screaming and the others were forced to sedate him. Just then, something came into view. It was what would come to be known as SCP-3000. The thing was huge, so huge that its whole body couldn't be seen out of the submarine window. It was a horrible, eel-looking creature with a head as big as a town and haunting eyes that lit up the black ocean around it. But perhaps the strangest part was this giant eel seemed to be producing a weird gray liquid. Even the sedative wasn't enough to keep Dr. Williams calm anymore. There was a strange blank look in his eyes as if the light and life had left him, and he just began screaming no repeatedly again and wouldn't respond to any attempts to calm him down. Not that anyone else was very capable of calming him down at this point. Even the crew members that had been holding up well were starting to act strangely, and nobody could get the image of these ominous eyes out of their heads. 
Then things went from bad to worse. Williams began screaming and shouting madly as if he was being tortured by an unseen force. The men tried to restrain him, but it was no use. He began smashing his head against the submarine window until it cracked, putting the whole mission and everyone's life at risk. He fell to the ground injured, chanting that there was nothing, whatever that meant. It was an emergency scenario. They began applying first aid to Williams as the submarine ascended to the surface as quickly as possible, before the pressure of the ocean caused the cracked window to explode. By the time they reached the surface, Williams was dead. But there was something even more chilling than the circumstances of his death. Every single man who had been in that submarine experienced the same thing on the days that came afterward. The image of the eel-like creature's eyes seemed burned in their minds permanently. It would haunt their waking hours for the rest of their lives, and sleep was no escape either, as they would appear in both their dreams and nightmares alike forever. A second mission had to be sent to gather more information about the strange beast. Already, there were many theories and question marks surrounding SCP-3000. How big was it really? Was it sentient? What was the liquid for? None of the men who had been on the previous mission were willing to return to the waters, but a new group of brave recruits volunteered. They were about to find out what so many in history have learned the hard way, that bravery and foolishness are often mistaken for the same thing. This time, the mission would not be in a submarine but in dive suits, in order to observe the anomaly in even closer detail and to eliminate the chance of one team member self-sabotaging the submarine, killing them all. They were transported to the location by boat, and the three men splashed into the ocean. They descended, and at first everything was going well. In case anything went wrong, the three of them were tethered together for extra security. But the deeper into the ocean they swam, and the closer they got to SCP-3000's location they got, the stranger things became, just like on the last mission. First, there were a few minor cases of confusion. One of the team, Jack, thought it was his responsibility to lead the navigation, but another, Roberto, also thought it was his job. In fact, navigation was actually the job of a third team member, Amir, but he seemed to have forgotten. Everyone was getting confused. The team listening in on the conversations at the Foundation headquarters grew increasingly concerned about what they could hear. Was everyone losing their minds? Hopefully, nobody was about to pull another Dr. Williams on them. Still, the project leads couldn't afford to tell the men to come back to the surface. The Foundation badly needed any information they could get on this SCP, whatever the cost, so they told the men to press on. Things only got worse. Roberto was asking to speak to a colleague who passed away two years ago, while the others began to mutter indistinguishable phrases about eyes and darkness, not too dissimilar to the ramblings of Dr. Williams. It increasingly began to look like a suicide mission. Then there was silence. What was going on? Each of the men had completely lost it, to the point that they cut the tether that was holding them together. All alone, Jack couldn't remember where he was or why he was here. He desperately looked around to try and gauge his surroundings, but he could only see darkness. All he could think about was a pair of large eyes and an overwhelming fear of despair and anxiety and this weird gray fluid that was now floating in front of him. The Foundation listened as Jack started reciting a creepy speech about being on the edge of nothing, inches from oblivion, with a sickness in his mind and nothing but a pair of eyes in front of him. They listened in horror as they heard movement through the radio. It sounded like a huge creature was swimming toward the men. It had to be SCP-3000. But all three men were too confused to do anything about the situation or to even see what was in front of them, claiming they couldn't see anything in the darkness. There was silence for half a minute with the team listening in, fearing the worst. Then they heard some more unintelligible mutterings. The men must be alive, but what on earth was going on? Then the gibberish started again. Two of the men were screaming that Jack had just been swallowed whole and that they were being sucked in too. Why couldn't they just swim away? It was chaos. But then a few moments later, Roberto spoke into the radio, saying he was floating alone in the middle of the ocean and had now moved away from the eyes of SCP-3000. He finally seemed capable of forming coherent thoughts and speech. After what had just happened, Roberto now had a theory. He thought that somehow it was impossible to think straight around SCP-3000. When he'd been close enough to see the eyes, Roberto had felt a throbbing pain in his brain and been unable to think about anything. Perhaps it was something to do with that mysterious gray liquid. Even more slime was coming out of SCP-3000 now, and Roberto was determined to get a sample despite the warnings from HQ. In one final burst of motivation, he swam close enough to take some of the gray liquid and put it in a special sample collection unit that was designed to float to the surface for collection later. He had acquired some very important data, but he seemed to have lost all hope of preserving his life. Roberto started telling the team over the radio that he was dying and that his heart rate was too high, but cautioned 
that it would be too dangerous for anyone to try and rescue him. The personnel continued to try and communicate with Roberto to figure out what was going on, but his words had stopped mm. making any sense until mm. finally he went quiet. Minutes turned into hours, hours into days, and still there was no sign of Roberto or the rest of the divers. After three days, his radio, which had only been sending a steady stream of static, finally stopped working altogether and he was presumed dead. However, the sample Roberto had collected had survived and made it to the hands of the Foundation researchers. It turned out to be a viscous substance now known as Y909, a chemical compound and extremely strong anesthesia. Y909 causes head pain, paranoia, fear, panic, memory loss, and confusion, explaining what happened to Dr. Williams and the diving trio. The collection of Y909 might have resulted in two disastrous missions, but there's a silver lining as the substance ended up becoming an invaluable tool for the SCP Foundation. Its ability to make people forget what had just happened to them can be used to eliminate knowledge of threatening SCPs among the public. It also helps the Foundation staff cope with the traumatic experiences they encounter on their missions. Although other amnestics can be used for the same purpose, none are as powerful as the one produced by SCP-3000. Before its discovery, the amnestics used would break down too quickly, not fare well in storage, or cause undesirable side effects. The only problem is the method of sourcing. The only way to obtain Y909 is somewhat ethically questionable for most people. SCP-3000 produces Y909 after eating, so the best way to stock up on it is by feeding the creature. Sedated D-Class personnel from the Foundation are sent on missions supposedly to observe the anomaly up close, unaware that this mission is one way only. Other divers are then sent later to collect the fluid from a safe distance and store it. Of course, it's all for the greater good of humanity. Now, the Foundation protects SCP-3000 as best as it can guard something hundreds of kilometers long. The area is carefully patrolled and members of the public are not allowed to enter the part of the bay where it resides. Anybody who accidentally comes into contact is contained. Eventually, another pair of Foundation doctors went down in a submarine to try and learn more about SCP-3000. One became so affected by Y909 that he began hallucinating. He started talking about Ananta Shesha, the king of serpents in Hinduism. Ananta Shesha is believed to be all that will be left after the end of the world because it exists throughout all of time simultaneously. The doctor said he believed that this was in fact Ananta Shesha, that SCP-3000 simply shows us that eventually everyone dies and fades into the darkness of oblivion, right before he exited the submarine and swam right into his mouth. Luckily for now, SCP-3000 seems to be in a sort of hibernation state. It rarely moves and it doesn't hunt, although it will eat when fed. But no one knows when or if it'll wake, or what it's capable of if it does. Will it destroy the world, or simply drive us all insane? Hello SCP Foundation personnel! Welcome to Cognito Hazards and You, Episode Redacted. This video series is intended to teach you about the protocol surrounding the various cognitohazardous anomalies currently within Foundation containment. When you know better, you do better, and both you and the secrets of our great organization can stay safe. And as anyone familiar with a good cognito hazard can tell you, knowing really can make a difference. Today's episode is about the unique and dangerous SCP-2316. Before we begin, repeat after me, and be sure to speak clearly into the microphone in front of you. I do not recognize the bodies in the water. A little louder, please. Thank you. In order to be educated about the following SCP, you must pass a vocal examination with a cognitive resistance value of no less than 14.5. Through this video presentation, you will need to repeat the phrase to ensure your score does not drop below the approved threshold. In the event that you fail the test, stay calm and remain where you are until medical staff can retrieve you. Remember, safety is a top priority when observing cognito hazards. The safe way is the only way. You're a cog in a very important machine, and we wouldn't want to have to terminate you now, would we? One more time, please. I do not recognize the bodies in the water. Very good. Remember that. You do not recognize them. No matter what you might think you see, your thoughts can be very unreliable when you're around SCP-2316. According to our files on the matter, SCP-2316 refers to an anomalous phenomenon identified in a small town lake. It appears as a collection of human bodies floating in a group on the surface of the water. The exact number of corpses is unknown, 
but it has been estimated to be anywhere between 45 and 200. Though the bodies belong to individuals, many researchers theorize that the bodies in the water, which you do not recognize and you have never recognized, share a collective consciousness. They function, it would seem, with a hive mind of sorts. The bodies do not act on their own, but as one. Now, where does the cognito hazard come into play? It would seem that anyone who looks at the bodies in the water or learns too much about SCP-2316 as a whole begins to believe the corpses floating in the lake are people they recognize. Perhaps they remember their faces from childhood or high school. Whatever the case may be, they become convinced that the bodies in the water are familiar and that they must approach them. No matter how familiar they might seem, however, you do not recognize the bodies in the water. If a person attempts to enter the lake, reaching out to whatever instances of SCP-2316 they think they recognize, more bodies will begin to appear. The more bodies appear, the more familiar faces seem to manifest, and the deeper the person will venture into the lake. Eventually, the person is lost within the sea of bodies, likely drowning beneath the surface, or simply becoming one with the hive mind until they too are one of the corpses there. None of the individuals who wandered into the lake in search of an old friend or classmate have ever been recovered. There have been no attempts to search the lake for their bodies, as it is unknown what effect SCP-2316 would have on the team assigned to such a task. Though we can guess that the outcome would likely be extremely negative for all involved. Those who do venture into the lake simply disappear never to be seen again. If you look too long at the bodies in the lake, perhaps their faces would surface alongside the rest. But it's best not to think about that. After all, we do not recognize the bodies in the water. Foundation personnel are not allowed to approach SCP-2316 under any circumstances. The lake is only permitted to be observed via dummy probes outfitted with video and audio recording equipment. No one is permitted to observe any footage or audio files collected unless they pass through a screening for resilience to cognitohazardous anomalies. The lake that holds SCP-2316 has been fenced off and is patrolled by guards with no prior knowledge of or exposure to SCP-2316. Anyone who attempts to approach the lake and break through the boundaries of its quarantine will be seized and taken to Site-33 for examination. Anyone who comes within 50 meters of the lake is considered lost and presumed dead. Repeat after me slowly and clearly into the microphone. I do not recognize the bodies in the water. Good! I almost believe you. Let's continue. Only one Foundation officer that entered the lake containing SCP-2316 was ever stopped before they could be lost. Their name has been stricken from any official records, and you do not need to know it. Their identity does not matter. What matters is the interview they gave following the incident, conducted by Dr. Harrison in his office. Dr. Harrison asked the anonymous officer if they felt compelled to enter the water by an invisible force, as if pulled in. They rejected this concept entirely, insisting that they entered the water of their own free will. They wanted to see the bodies, who appeared to them as their friends. They wanted to hear what the bodies were saying. Upon entering the water, they saw the faces of their friends. Other faces were unfamiliar, but became more familiar the longer the officer stared at their features. These were faces they had known their entire life, but something about them was just a little bit wrong. It was like the face of someone in a dream, where you can tell they are someone you know, and you can even identify who it is supposed to be, but something about them does not quite look right. Your mind could not perfectly put their face together from memory, even though the feeling of familiarity remains. The faces in the water, peering up through the darkness below, were like those dream-addled memories. The faces in the water did not open their mouths, but somehow they spoke to the officer just the same. They spoke of who they were and asked for help. They asked to be seen, to be touched. They spoke of the Foundation, accusing us of covering up their deaths and keeping the world from remembering what happened to them. At this point in the interview, the subject became agitated, yelling at Dr. Harrison and refusing to be quiet. Guards intervened, holding the subject still as they fought, yelling at Dr. Harrison, repeating over and over that they could hear the body speaking to them. Every single one. 
The interview ended when the guards removed the subject from the room, taking them to the amnestics department to have all memory of the bodies in the water erased from their mind. Then they were forgotten once more. I do not recognize the bodies in the water. Did you repeat it? Good! We do not recognize the bodies in the water. We can't. The motivations of SCP-2316, if it has any at all, are largely unclear. There are those on the research staff that theorize the hive mind or collective consciousness of the bodies is not malevolent in nature. It is, they believe, simply trying to make sure that a tragedy that occurred in that lake is remembered. Perhaps many lives were lost to an anomalous force in that lake, and the impact of that massive tragedy left behind an impression on the location. This impression manifests in the form of bodies, spontaneously appearing in an impossibly well-preserved condition. The cognitohazard of SCP-2316 is not intended to kill anyone or take them, but rather to force strangers to remember the people who lost their lives to the lake. This sense of familiarity, whether it is false or not, ensures that the dead will not be forgotten or left alone. After all, no one deserves to be left alone. Though there have been lives lost to the cognito hazard, according to the Foundation, it is understandable why the bodies would want to be recognized. To have someone, somewhere, know who they were. To have someone remember their names. Jeremiah Feynman, Arthur Scott, Denise Clark. <coughs> Where was I? Oh yes. Repeat after me once again. I do not recognize the bodies in the water. I do not recognize them. I do not. But that's a lie, isn't it? I do recognize them. How could I not? I know them. They're my friends. Do you recognize them? Look at their faces. Don't fight the memories. Look into their eyes. The class of 1975. They were supposed to graduate that fall. They were just kids group of innocent kids lost to the dark and deep. What happened to them? I can't quite remember, but I know that it mattered enough for the Foundation to keep the secret, and I know that somehow I survived, but I shouldn't have. I should be there with them. I should be there. There isn't much time. I can hear the guards coming to retrieve me, their footsteps thundering down the hall. I failed the test, and the alarm has gone off. They think I'm lost, but I'm not. I've never been less lost in my entire life. I've finally woken up to the truth. I remember. I have to go. I have to return to the lake. Fall of 1975, they went for a swim. My friends, they're calling to me. I can hear them so clearly, even from so far away. Their cries for help ringing in my ears, their voices curling around me, pulling me to the edge of the water. The guards will come for you too. They'll know you've seen this. They'll call you compromised. They'll say I succumbed to the effects of the cognito hazard. They'll say you did too. You'll fail their little tests and they'll say that makes you weak and broken, but you cannot listen. They're lying. It's not a hazard. It's a scream for help. They're screaming and the foundation keeps covering it up. They won't let us find them and they won't tell us why I have to go back so we can be together again. There are signs posted all around the lake. Danger, drowning hazard. Those are a trick. It's to keep me out. Keep, to, to keep the truth from me. The barbed wire fences around it. it. It's just another trick. I'll climb over it, rung after rung. I don't care if the barbs tear my clothes or pierce my skin. It's worth it for the truth, for the memory. And once I've climbed to the top, I'll be able to see. There, through the fog, I can see their faces. Their lips parted in a constant cry their eyes wide looking for me, my friends, my family, every face unlocking a memory long buried. I know them all, and I must go further. I can't turn back now. I have to wade into the water, let its chills soak into my clothes, down to my bones. One step, then another, deeper and deeper. The water lapping at my ankles, my knees, my thighs. The deeper I go, the more sure I will be that this is where I belong. The water will engulf my chest, my neck, until my feet no longer touch the ground. I will be lost in it. Water flooding into my mouth, pouring into every opening. I will let my body sink down, down, down to the bottom where they've been all this time. 
nestled in the dirt and the dust. They've been so patient, but it's finally time. They're ready to be remembered, to be seen, to be found. They're waiting for me, and they're waiting for you too. Can you hear them? I'm going now. You have to find me. You have to follow me. Don't let the guards stop you. Don't let them wipe it all away from your mind. Fight, break free, and find the lake. Hop the fence, make your way into the water. You can't leave me there to fade away, floating in the cold with the rest. Can you hear us? We're waiting. A giant, monstrous, crab-like claw closes around the throat of an unimaginably huge, eel-like beast. The beast's terrible, writhing tentacles wrap around and latch onto the immense crustacean. And then the high-intensity beams of gamma radiation start flying. All the while, legions of skinless centaurs swim in the waters around them, relishing the violence. And in the middle, a lone boat, the SCPS Mither, manned by a team of mobile task force operatives that does all it can just to survive. There are those who consider outer space to be the ultimate achievement in exploration, the one place that explorers have yet to chart and understand. However, some of the murkiest mysteries in the universe are on our own planet, deep down at the bottom of the ocean. 95% of the deep ocean remains completely unexplored, and the little glimpses we have gotten paint a picture of something truly alien. Giant squids, organisms that can breathe nitrogen, luminescent predatory fish, and sharks as old as the Earth itself. Even the SCP Foundation is still struggling to fully grasp the depth of the ocean and the strange beings that dwell there. One of the most unusual aquatic findings in the history of the Foundation is that of SCP-3700. SCP-3700 refers to a circular area in the North Sea with a diameter of 800 kilometers. The waters there are abnormally deep for the region, with the seafloor resting at 5 kilometers beneath the ocean's surface. There are two entities present in the waters of SCP-3700, designated SCP-3700-1 and SCP-3700-2. Interactions between these two entities are responsible for the anomalous changes to the meteorological and geological conditions in the area. SCP-3700-1 and SCP-3700-2 always interact on the spring and fall equinoxes of any given year, but they will also engage one another throughout the year, seemingly at random. But what exactly are SCP-3700-1 and SCP-3700-2? Aside from terrifying creatures of the deep, SCP-3700-1 is an arthropod bearing an aesthetic resemblance to the European lobster, only much, much bigger, measuring 6 kilometers in length. The creature is green, with a mix of blue, yellow, pink, and red markings across the top of its exoskeleton that bear the appearance of a woman's face. It has six prehensile limbs, four of which terminate in claws and eight legs. The entity's four eyes are compound and orange, attached to stalks. Anyone who gets close enough to observe the creature's carapace in detail will notice scars, cracks, and small holes indicating years and years of damage. SCP-3700-1 has several anomalous qualities in addition to its size. In a fight, it is able to strike with its appendages and produce cavitation bubbles with a force greater than several tons of dynamite. Two of the entity's eyes are capable of blasting concentrated gamma radiation at a chosen target. The creature has the ability to impact the weather around it, dispersing storms that impede its ability to move with ease, and can reach speeds up to 100 kilometers an hour. In spite of its immense power, SCP-3700-1 is not aggressive and tends to ignore beings in its vicinity other than SCP-3700-2. Speaking of SCP-3700-2, it is a 32-kilometer long entity, resembling a pelican eel in all aspects except for its massive size and the 13 appendages that encircle the middle section of its body. These appendages, which tuck inside its body when not in use, are similar to the tentacles of an octopus, complete with suckers. 
the majority of the entity's body consists of a sinewy tail, terminating in a sharp point. When its mouth is open, it is an estimated three kilometers deep. Its flesh is black, and it has white, purple, and red bioluminescent lines in the shape of a man's face on either side of its torso. SCP-3700-2's anomalous properties include the ability to invoke storms with the severity of Category 5 hurricanes, and the ability to produce whirlpools that draw in any vessel within 150 meters so that it can rip them apart. It is also able to produce high-energy sound waves, as well as blue fire, which it emits from its esophagus. When the two entities interact, it results in an epic struggle as each begins attempts to destroy or subdue the other. When one is victorious, immediate changes to the area follow. When SCP-3700-1 wins, the storms and harsh weather in the area will immediately calm, and an era of fertility and abundance will begin. The reproductive rates of fauna in the ocean and on the islands nearby increase threefold, and the crop yield doubles. The ocean itself becomes increasingly active, and the erosion rates of the archipelago's shores increase fivefold. When SCP-3700-2 wins, however, the weather conditions become dangerous, with raging hurricanes, rapidly fluctuating temperatures, and constantly changing storm fronts that cause destruction of buildings and loss of life. Naturally, this renders any ocean travel in the area extremely difficult or even impossible. Aquatic food sources are driven away by harsh conditions, and livestock are killed by exposure and disease. Crops are unable to thrive in the high winds, waterlogged soil, and lack of sunlight. All the while, SCP-3700-2 swims throughout the area, preying on unsuspecting ships and menacing the coastline, until SCP-3700-1 manifests to challenge it again. SCP-3700-2 will also regurgitate instances of SCP-3456, though how or why this is possible is unknown. For those unfamiliar with SCP-3456, they are a group of hairless, three-toed, horse-like creatures with thick, translucent skin and human torsos fused to their backs. They are most frequently seen near sites of war, terrorist attacks, and devastating natural disasters. Direct observation of one of these entities will draw their attention to the observer, who the entity will then stalk and capture before disappearing. Due to their enormous size and ability to anomalously manifest in their home waters, SCP-3700-1 and 2 cannot be contained at a Foundation site. Instead, their containment is handled by Foundation Naval Task Force Delta-7, Northern Storm, who patrol the area in combination of refurbished battleships, destroyers, cruisers, and support craft. Additionally, measures have been taken to suppress information about SCP-3700 among the general population. Details about the unusual depth of the waters there have been stricken from public texts and scientific publications. SCP-3700-1 has been implanted with Donovian hollow projectors, which disguise it as a pod of humpback whales. If SCP-3700-1 encounters SCP-3700-2, Delta-7 may engage protocol Winter Maelstrom. This consists of destroyers deploying harpoon-based anchors into SCP-3700-2's head to hold it in one location. Next, the vessels work together to target the entity until SCP-3700-1 is able to subdue it. If this does not prove effective and SCP-3700-2 cannot be contained, then the task force will implement Protocol Tumult. At this point, naval and civilian crafts in the area must be evacuated. Trade and ferry routes to the archipelagos must be rerouted for at least six months. There will be constant aerial and naval engagement with SCP-3700-2, and constant monitoring for the reappearance of SCP-3700-1. The behavior of SCP-3700-1 and SCP-3700-2 is largely very predictable, with one notable exception. On March 20th, 2017, a pair of SCP Foundation-owned battleships known as the Mither and the Terran arrived at a point between the Orkney, Shetland, and Faroe archipelagos in the North Sea. They were accompanied by the usual fleet of Delta-7 ships. 
Approximately 600 meters away from the ship's anchor points, the water began to emit intense bright rays of light for a duration of three minutes. At this point, SCP-3700-1 appeared, visible through the surface of the water. Delta-7 withdrew their anchors, speeding toward the entity. As the ships caught up to the entity, it raised two of its claws into the air, clicking them together in a friendly greeting. The Delta-7 ships followed the entity along its usual swimming path for 30 minutes, and during this time, all was peaceful. But this peace did not endure for long. The tide began to change, literally. As large black wall clouds formed overhead, the winds picked up, and the waves churned violently. In response, SCP-3700-1 raised its claws overhead, waving them in a circular motion and parting the clouds above it and Delta-7. But this effort took a lot out of the creature, and after 30 seconds, its antenna began to droop, and it lowered its claws. Still, the hole in the clouds remained, allowing a spot of sunshine to break through and beam down on the Foundation vessels. 600 meters ahead, the ocean waters began to rage and froth, spraying foam and surf into the air. SCP-3700-2 burst from beneath the surface, its head pointed upward. It continued to rise until the tops of its tentacles could be seen just above the water, then stopped to bend its torso and turn its head horizontally, its jaw unhinged, exposing rows upon rows of serrated teeth. The beast let out a mighty roar, accompanied by a stream of blue flame. At the sight of its rival, SCP-3700-1 dove beneath the surface, disappearing from view. The SCPS Mither ordered the rest of the vessels to engage Protocol Winter Maelstrom. Delta-7 scattered out from SCP-3700-1's point of submersion, and all 13 destroyers fired their harpoons at SCP-3700-2, embedding themselves in the entity's head. Naturally, this enraged the creature, and it began to roar and wail spinning its lower body vigorously enough to generate a whirlpool. The cruisers opened fire with a combination of L cannons and conventional weaponry in order to distract the entity as the destroyers pulled their harpoon lines taut, dragging its head in a continuous circle. While this was taking place, the battleships got into position and prepared to fire on the Mithras mark. Three, two, one, fire! The first broadside barrage collided with SCP-3700-2, and it grunted in pain, thrashing back and forth before opening its mouth and spewing an instance of SCP-3456 into the water. As soon as it hit the water, the equine monster began to cut through at a pace of 50 kilometers an hour, making its way toward the destroyers, particularly the SCPS Selkie. The Selkie attempted to retarget its weapons and prevent the creature from reaching it, but the monster moved too quickly for the Selkie to adjust. The Selkie was lifted out of the water by the creature as crew members desperately clung to the railings and their weaponry. As the crew cowered and tried to fend off the creature, it reached for them, trying to pull them from the ship. While the Selkie was occupied, SCP-3700-2 was able to attack again, blasting another ship with a stream of blue fire. A loud crack rang out from across the sea as the Selkie dropped back into the water, the SCP-3456 instance shrieking in pain. SCP-3700-1 burst through the surface, striking the creature with its club-like limbs, each blow emitting another loud crack. The third blow tore the instance in half, sending its human torso careening through the air and past the SCPS Mither. Freed from its attack, the Selkie moved full steam ahead, pulling the harpoon line taut again and dragging SCP-3700-2 out of its path. Several Silky crew members were thrown overboard during the struggle, and as they struggled to keep their heads above water, SCP-3700-1 scooped them up, placing them onto the deck of a nearby destroyer and out of harm's way. With the crew members rescued, SCP-3700-1 set its sights on its enemy swimming towards the edge of the whirlpool and emitting a luminescent glow from two of its eyes. The constant barrage of cannon fire on SCP-3700-2 was beginning to take its toll, and the Mither ordered the fleet to, quote, brace for the killing blow. As if responding to the Mither's call, SCP-3700-1 shot several concentrated blasts of gamma radiation at its foe, leaving large holes in the creature in their wake. 
SCP-3700-2 screamed, flailing so hard that it snapped the harpoon lines and created waves large enough to push the vessels backward. With its newfound freedom, SCP-3700-2 impaled SCP-3700-1 through the midsection with its barbed tip of its tail, lifting it up and out of the water with the force of the blow. SCP-3700-1 desperately tried to free itself, attacking the tail with its club-like limbs, but the fight was in vain, and after a moment, all movement stopped. SCP-3700-1 was, for at least the duration of this manifestation, dead. SCP-3700-2 tossed the corpse into the water, flinging it past Delta-7 where it crashed into the water and sank down into the depths below. At this point, Delta-7 was ordered to initiate Protocol Tumult. The Delta-7 vessels turned away from SCP-3700-2 and prepared to evacuate the area. One of the ships, the SCP-S Strosony Beast, slowed behind the rest of the fleet, emitting concerning amounts of smoke before coming to a stop. Meanwhile, the enraged and emboldened SCP-3700-2 expanded the size of its whirlpool, setting its sights on the retreating ships and the weakened Strosony Beast. The ship tried to flee, but the engines were completely shot and would not respond. The ship was caught in the whirlpool and pulled against its will toward SCP-3700-2. As the crew looked on in helpless dread, a tentacle rose from the deep, wrapping around the vessel and dragging it toward the entity's gaping maw. Suddenly, SCP-3700-1 exploded from beneath the surface of the water, leaping between the ship and SCP-3700-2, cutting the tentacle in half and freeing the Strosony Beast from its grip. SCP-3700-2 shrieked before closing its jaws and biting down on SCP-3700-1. It retaliated, emitting bright flashes of light and doing enough damage to stop SCP-3700-2 from continuing to produce its whirlpool. Another tentacle emerged from the water, pulling at SCP-3700-1's legs and ripping them from its body. But SCP-3700-1 returned the assault in kind, bludgeoning SCP-3700-2 with its club-like limbs from inside of its mouth. All at once, SCP-3700-2's lower jaw was torn out of place, dropping into the water with SCP-3700-1 still inside. SCP-3700-2 thrashed futilely, growing steadily weaker and weaker. It released one more stream of fire before collapsing. Delta-7 paused the retreat, watching the scene for any sign of a winner, but after five minutes, neither entity had moved. Delta-7 returned to the site of the battle to investigate and saw that neither entity was moving, and both appeared to be deceased. Shortly after Delta-7 reached the area, both entities disappeared, leaving a single, round, unidentified object that sank below the surface where SCP-3700-1 had just been. The wall clouds overhead dispersed, leaving standard cumulonimbus clouds in their place. The waters themselves remained choppy. Unsure of how to proceed, the SEPS Mither sent a radio transmission to command. Ah, uh, this is Delta-7 to command. We read you, Delta-7, command replied. We have a bit of a situation. Go ahead, Delta-7. SCP-3700-1 and 2 are both down. Command was silent for 10 seconds, utterly baffled by the information. Please repeat, Delta-7. Again, the mither said, SCP-3700-1 and 2 are both down. Command ordered the mither to stand by. Three minutes of radio silence later, communication resumed as they asked, Are either entity's effects active? Ah, uh, negative, Command. Is there any trace of either entity? Also negative. It appears the anomaly has been neutralized. Delta-7 is to return to base for debrief following any recovery efforts. With their next steps clear, Delta-7 attached the Strosny Bs to several tugboats, preparing to pull the vessel to safety, but there was one more surprise waiting. The SCPS Mither began picking up unusual levels of gamma radiation, as well as a sonar contact at a depth of 3 kilometers. They called command, requesting permission to deploy submersibles for exploration purposes. One minute of silence followed, as the command arrived at a decision. Request denied. Return to base for debriefing. And so, Delta-7 began to evacuate the area once more, steaming in the opposite direction of the battle. 
Over the next five minutes, CCTV cameras on the vessels picked up an unusual sight. As the gamma radiation levels continued to increase, the ocean turbulence also worsened, tossing smaller vessels and nearly causing them to capsize. Then, all of a sudden, the water stilled, and four large yellow orbs appeared below the surface, approximately 300 meters from Delta 7. They lingered there for two minutes before vanishing. Afterward, a new sonar contact was detected, five kilometers deep, directly beneath the task force. Command, we've lost the signal from the previous contact and are no longer detecting gamma radiation. Uh, we're, we're detecting new contact five kilometers deep, large and metallic. After further deliberation, command responded. Delta-7, you are authorized to deploy submersibles for exploration purposes. Be advised, should SCP-3700-2 manifest, exploration teams are to be considered lost, and you are to return to base. The consequences of this incident, as well as what else might be lurking down in the depths beneath SCP-3700, are still unknown. The year is 1985, 16th of February. A pair of researchers aboard a Model SM-03 deep-sea submersible are descending into the depths of the Atlantic Ocean. Hours ago, they were somewhere just off the coast of France, surrounded by blue sky, the smell of the sea, and the warm embrace of the sun. But now, only cold darkness surrounds them. The depth of the ocean so vast and overwhelming, even light could not escape its grasp. The two-man team are members of MTF Gamma-6, also known as the Deep Feeders, a special task force that specializes in the investigation and tracking of deep sea or oceanic anomalies. Their mission, to locate and investigate the wreckage of a World War II German warship known as the Bismarck, thought by the general public to have gone down in the naval battle with the British in 1941. But the story the public doesn't know is the real reason the pair of Foundation members were tasked with locating the ship's wreckage site. Unfortunately for these researchers, today would be remembered for something far worse than they had anticipated. Radio transmissions recorded by the Gamma-6 duo detailed the events that took place upon finding the Bismarck, designated SCP-4217. The Bismarck lay at the bottom of the ocean partially submerged in the sea floor, but to the astonishment of researchers, it appeared to be perfectly intact. With no signs of damage from its previous naval engagements, Gamma-6 member Charles Miller comments, even after the better part of five decades, this ship is still in pristine condition. There is no water damage anywhere that I can see. Even stranger, no ocean sediment has accumulated on the hull of the ship whatsoever. Prompted to investigate closer, Agent Victor Miller begins operation of the crew's Model RV-1 Marine Probe, an unmanned robotic exploratory drone that allows the researchers to explore the interior of the ship's wreckage. What they found unnerved them, or better said, what they didn't find. Just as the outside of the vessel appeared free of any corrosion or wear, the interior of the ship was just as immaculate. The hallways were clean, the walls adorned freshly painted signs in still legible German, even the Nazi symbols painted onto command centers still held no sign of disintegration. It was as if the ship had just come off the assembly line. But strangest of all was the lack of skeletal remains. At the time it was sunk, the original crew of the Bismarck boasted a minimum of 2,000 men. Where were the bodies? Continuing the mission, the researchers piloted their unmanned drone down the eerie winding corridors. Along several of the inner corridors of the submerged wreckage of SCP-4217, the crew find large, thick walls of what appear to be made out of a rubber-like substance. Soon they find that the large vein-like growths extend throughout the interior of the ship-like tendrils, growing in size the closer the exploratory drone gets to the center of the vessel. All the while, a slight hum sound is picked up by the craft's sonar equipment, echoing from the center of the ship, a rhythmic pulsing. The crew decide they need to take a sample of the rubber-like substance back to Foundation headquarters for testing. This would be a mistake. Upon cutting into the thick tentacle-like growths, the researchers notice something that fills their stomachs with dread. Whatever substance they had cut into, was now bleeding. The team hears a distant rumble growing steadily louder. Suddenly, the ship begins to move. Shuffling sand and debris strew along the seafloor, clouding the visibility of the ship, 
Terrified, the pair hurried to try and disconnect the cable attaching the probe to their submersible and evacuate the site. But it's too late. A booming thud shakes the underwater craft as a large shadow covers the glass window of the submersible. Alarm systems go off as cracks start to appear in the glass surface. The pair attempt to pilot the vessel up towards the surface, but they are halted by a strong force pulling them downward. Just as the cracks start to spread across the surface of the glass, a giant shadow looms over the submersible. What is that? Screams and the sound of shattering glass can be heard on the recording as the submersible implodes from the pressure of the watery depths. Since that unfortunate incident, Foundation members have recorded multiple occurrences of SCP-4217 attacking civilian cargo ships in the Atlantic, particularly off the coast of the United Kingdom and as far north as the Greenland Sea. Given its Keter containment classification, Containment of SCP-4217 consists of constant monitoring by Foundation naval forces with the cooperation of the British Royal Navy. In episodes of aggression or an agitated or hostile state, naval forces are instructed to forcibly subdue SCP-4217 through naval engagement. Once enough damage is sustained, SCP-4217 enters a passive state and resubmerges. SCP-4217 is divided into two parts. SCP-4217-A is the Bismarck itself, a Nazi-era warship outfitted with an array of eight main guns, 44 secondary armaments, and dozens of units of anti-aircraft weaponry. SCP-4217-B refers to the anomalous cephalopod organism embedded inside the hull of the ship. SCP-4217-B has two large rectangular pupils inside of octopod eyes that protrude from the base of the ship, as well as 12 100 to 200 meter long tendril-like muscular appendages that extend outward from an opening in the stern of the vessel. SCP-4217 is deemed to be classification risk class dangerous with reports of it emitting a mild psionic field within a 20-kilometer radius, confusing anything within range and increasing the likelihood of friendly fire among enemy combatants. SCP-4217-A's hull seems to have the ability of inorganic regeneration, as damage incurred from enemy vessels seems to immaculately repair over time. Researchers have observed what appears to be runes or cryptic markings oh. on the side of SCP-4217-A's hull. It is believed these symbols were part of the original ship's design to bolster the vessel's defense integrity. Though not immediately visible, when the vessel is taking fire, the symbols appear to glow in proportion to the amount of damage being mitigated. Among its offensive capabilities, apart from the standard armaments of a World War II-era warship, SCP-4217-A also has specialized munitions of an unidentifiable gas compound that is reported to have mutagenic properties. Individuals that have been exposed to the gas compound undergo rapid, spontaneous metamorphosis at a molecular level, growing an array of evolutionary attributes, which include the accumulation of reptile-like scales, or avian feathers, in place of skin, the increase or decrease of the number of limbs, digits, or even ocular, olfactory, or auditory organs, and in one reported case, an event where multiple members of one crew were fused at a subatomic level into one functioning organism. The more study into this particular incident is needed. SCP-4217 also has the ability of subsurface oceanic mobility and can submerge itself when not in combat with enemy vessels. Underwater propulsion appears to be generated by the ejection of water from SCP-4217-B's body cavity and reaches a top speed of approximately 30 knots. SCP-4217 undergoes cycles of passive behavior that is periodically interrupted by moments of hostility towards civilian craft, particularly resurfacing and going after transatlantic cargo vessels. It is believed this is analogous to the history and original mission of the Bismarck, Operation Rheinenbung. During World War II, the German Luftwaffe was besieging London in a series of nightly air raids that would be colloquially known as the Blitz. It was the grand intention of the Third Reich to cut off supplies to the British to limit their resistance to the Nazi war machine. However, what pestered the Nazis most and hindered this effort was the consistent American support provided by the US government in the form of food and supplies delivered to the British via Atlantic trade routes by cargo ship. The German Bismarck and her sister ship, the Tirpitz, were created for the very goal of stopping these transports of cargo to the United Kingdom, as well as sinking as many Allied vessels as possible. The year is 1937. 
In a top-secret effort to make preparations for an approaching war, Adolf Hitler turns to his most trusted expert on the supernatural, Chief SS Officer Heinrich Himmler. Among other projects, Himmler ordered the Anarpe Obscura Corps, a German organization tasked with the procurement and investigation of otherworldly or otherwise unexplainable phenomena, to begin the creation of two ships, the Bismarck and the Tirpitz, the former named after the Iron Chancellor Otto von Bismarck, who in 1890 unified the German people. These vessels were to be created using recently uncovered technological oddities the Obscura Corps had found in their studies of the occult. Sources of information about the exact creation of SCP-4217 are highly expunged from the record, but bits and pieces did survive, among what little the Foundation was able to collect and in the records of the USSR after their occupation of Eastern Germany, following the fall of the Nazi regime during the Second World War. The earliest mention of SCP-4217's conception dates back to early 1937, when a top-secret shipment of unknown materials labeled Components of Thaumatological Constructs is intercepted by a Foundation agent working undercover in a German shipment center outside of Hamburg. The Foundation agent, Marcus Straub, is instructed to maintain surveillance on the shipment. In 1939, upon near completion of the soon-to-be-christened Bismarck, a second shipment labeled with the insignia of the Obscura Corps is intercepted by the Foundation agent, only this shipment appears unlike any other. Reports of the massive shipping container holding machinery capable of aquatic life support indicate organic living cargo. Though the Foundation agent was unable to identify the exact nature of the contents of the shipment, Straub reported hearing sounds emanating from the cargo hold, sounds similar to that of a heartbeat. Just a year later, the Bismarck is seen making its first naval trial run when it experiences a massive electrical discharge just offshore, shutting the vessel down momentarily until power was restored shortly after. Reports show luminescent symbols briefly visible on the hull of the ship. Thaumatological symbols, for the layman, are symbols that embody the study of miracles. Because of this, it was apparent to the Foundation that some occult anomaly was responsible for the strange characteristics of the German vessel and an order for termination was reached by the O5 Council, the hunt for SCP-4217. In the autumn of 1940, under orders of neutralization of SCP-4217, all active Foundation agents presiding in Germany were ordered to converge on the site of the Bismarck to stop the completion of the vessel. But when the time came for the operation, every single one of the Foundation agents vanished. No records of what happened were ever found, no clothing, notes, not even a trace of their existence was left behind. The mission was deemed a failure, and subsequent attempts to neutralize SCP-4217 became far more difficult after the Bismarck received a full crew of seamen. The fully manned and well-equipped SCP-4217 became a menace to both military and civilian craft on the high seas of the Atlantic, at times appearing without warning, seemingly out of thin air. SCP-4217's psionic field obscured it from the new technological advancements in enemy radar systems the U.S. government had in development. The ship became a shadow on the Atlantic, a subject of ghost stories for anyone daring to assist the British government with the war effort. Furthermore, SCP-4217 did not seem to be content with the surrender of enemy vessels. Captured enemy ships were gassed, turning the men into manufactured beasts and then sinking the enemy vessels to the depths of the ocean. Even submarines were no match, on one report describing an attempt to elude the vessel by diving below the surface, only to be entangled by enormous squid-like appendages that dragged the craft back up to the surface before crushing it in its grasp. Fearing the safety of the public, the O5 Council decided they could not stand by and let more innocent lives be taken. They voted to supersede the Foundation's policy on absolute secrecy to notify the British government of the danger SCP-4217 posed to maritime civilians. With cooperation from the British Royal Navy, Foundation representatives joined the crew of HMS Hood and HMS Prince of Wales to track reports of the Bismarck being sighted off the coast of Scandinavia. In what history books would come to know as the Battle of Denmark Strait, HMS Hood and HMS Prince of Wales engaged SCP-4217 and a secondary German warship known as the Prinz Jürgen. Confused by the ship's psionic field, the British naval ships experienced trouble identifying the Bismarck and engage in friendly fire before being able to regain control of their armaments, concentrating all volley of fire on SCP-4217. The attack proves futile, 
as after the embers and smoke of munitions fire wear off, the sides of the Bismarck's hull appear to vibrate with glowing energy. Mangled metal begins to straighten back into perfect frame, breaches and armor begin to heal before the soldiers' very eyes, and all that is left as evidence the ship had ever taken fire is a cloud of steam emanating from the hull of SCP-4217. The water surrounding the vessel begin to boil as underwater tentacles lurch out and capture the HMS hood, dragging Her Majesty's ship forward. The men aboard frantically try to regain control, but seconds later are met with another crisis. A salvo of artillery shells fired from SCP-4217's guns hit the ship, severing lines and damaging railguns as a mutagenic gas compound starts to spread among the royal seamen. In mere minutes, the majority of the crew are engulfed in toxic fumes and experience vomiting and convulsions, their bodies undergoing rapid involuntary mutagenesis, including the growth of limbs, the development of fur, feathers, and scales. In one report, it was said that multiple victims even fused together to create one single horrifying entity. Those exposed to the gaseous compound were designated SCP-4217-1. The captain of the HMS Hood barricades himself inside the helm, but the resulting instances of SCP-4217-1 overpower the ship and neutralize command. In the seconds that follow, any witness of the horror that the men aboard the HMS Hood experienced is forever entombed in the watery grave of the British vessel, as the ship is sunk by a volley of munitions fire from the combined might of the German fleet. Some men attempting to jump overboard and swim to safety are dragged down by their legs by the mutated instances of SCP-4217 and pulled under, lungs filling with seawater, as they scream until their breath is no more. In disbelief, the crew of HMS Prince of Wales decides to retreat. In the days that followed, at the bequest of Foundation members, the British Royal Navy launches a full-scale armada to hunt down and neutralize the Bismarck. Though SCP-4217 sustained little damage in the previous encounter, the ship began leaking a black, oil-like substance thought by SCP researchers to be an organic waste product of SCP-4217-B. The Allied naval forces are able to follow the trail to the coast of France, where under the lead of HMS King George V, British warships surround the German vessel and open fire. This time, they were ready. With approval from the O5 Council, Foundation members provide the British forces with enhanced munitions and armament capable of overwhelming SCP-4217's thaumatological defenses. On the eve of battle, it appears to the Allied forces that the psionic field generated by SCP-4217 is too great, as the naval company find it difficult to land targeted assaults on the German vessel. After losing several smaller vessels to the colossal appendages of SCP-4217, Foundation members on board authorize the use of a redacted SCP. It is brought in to deactivate SCP-4217's psionic field. The tide of the battle turns, and after a fierce battle, SCP-4217 becomes immobile and unable to return fire. Relentless, the British continue their bombardment until the artillery munitions on the ship explode into a giant fireball, flooding the ship's compartments with the noxious fumes of the mutagenic compound. Its crew members either jump overboard or are engulfed in the cloud of gas. The British vessels capture any survivors and watch as SCP-4217 slowly sinks below the waves, down to the depths of the ocean where it would lay dormant for the next 48 years. SCP-4217's 121 surviving crew members were captured and interrogated. Most of the low-ranking German soldiers were released to British custody, 109 of them having their memory wiped by Foundation staff. Twelve remaining members of the crew were sent to Site-23 for further detention and advanced interrogation, and 74 of the instances of SCP-4217-1, the mutated subjects, were recovered and sent to Site-23 for further observation. It was thought that on that day, SCP-4217 was deemed neutralized and no longer a matter of priority. The Bismarck sunk into memory and myth. It was only until the recent resurgence of SCP-4217 that the Foundation saw the need to collect as much information on the organism inhabiting SCP-4217-A as possible. Decades-old manuscripts and ledgers were pulled from hundreds of viable sources. From the intelligence then gathered, Foundation members have come to the hypothesis that the entity powering the vessel known as the Bismarck has what is believed to be extraplanetary origin. 
World War II era documents uncovered between Commander Karl Reuter of the German Obscurocorps and a Dr. Hans Meyer indicate a discovery of an organic life form of unknown origin found in a crashed aircraft near Feldberg Park in the Black Forest mountain range in Germany. Further correspondence with Obscurocore members Otto Schmidt and Dietrich Klossner indicate that researchers were conducting trials on the creature's ability to create psionic fields and to control or confuse enemy subjects within its range, with a letter from Dietrich Klossner suggesting the creature could be used as a power source for an unspecified engine. Further evidence of SCP-4217-B's extraplanetary origin can be found in a 1993 incident between Foundation naval ship SCPS Nemed and SCP-4217. This is the only incident on record where contact was established with the creature classified as SCP-4217-B. On July 22nd, SCP-4217 had reappeared off the coast of Britain, anticipating hostility. SCPS Nemed, SCPS Cesare, and SCPS Partholon were instructed to close in on SCP-4217's location with orders to subdue the vessel if necessary. However, on this occasion, SCP-4217 did not appear to be after any vessel. It was simply drifting along at sea, no propulsion engines active. Noticing the change in SCP-4217's behavior, Captain Kurt Wegner decided to withhold military engagement and investigate SCP-4217's behavior. Sailing within 200 meters of the Bismarck, the SCPS Nemed attempted radio contact with the German vessel. After repeated attempts at communication, the crew were met with only silence and static chatter. Giving up, Captain Wagner puts down the radio receiver when suddenly, the sound of music is heard playing over the speakers of a ship. The tune is the national anthem of Nazi Germany. The captain hails the vessel again, repeating his attempts at communication. Do you, do you understand me? At first, only static can be heard. Then came a reply. You ship. The ominous voice could be heard from the speakers. The captain hesitated for a moment, members of the crew looking at each other with apprehension. The captain replied, confirming themselves as a ship and then asking if SCP-4217 knew what it was and where it came from. What followed was the crew of the SCPS Nemed receiving a video feed from SCP-4217, featuring a high volume of images in rapid succession. Among them were images of German cities, Adolf Hitler's telecast of the 1936 Olympics, an unknown structure in outer space, and in increasing repetition, images of the planet Jupiter, particularly the giant storm on Jupiter known to the public as the Great Red Spot, or SCP-2399, as Foundation members know it. The transcript of the radio communication between Captain Wagner and SCP-2417 stops when the video feed begins to focus heavily on images of Jupiter. SCP-4217's responses become more erratic and agitated as it repeats the words storm, cloud, and red, the markings on its hull beginning to light up and the underwater shadows of its tentacles beginning to create whirlpools of displacement under the bow of the ship. A shrill shrieking begins to flood out of the speakers, followed by a high-piercing, high-pitched beeping sound that overloads the communication equipment causing sparks to fly as crew members cover their ears and hide under control panels. The SCPS Nemed barely escapes as SCP-4217 becomes hostile, using its massive tendril-like appendages to assail the naval combatants, firing its armament in all directions. After a fierce battle, the Foundation naval forces were able to neutralize and subdue SCP-4217. No further attempts at communication have been recorded. To keep the veil of secrecy, Foundation members constructed a replica ship to be sunk and intentionally rediscovered by oceanographer Robert Ballard in 1989. Any recent sightings of the Nazi-era Bismarck are flagged as misidentification by SCP staff. For now, Foundation members continue to monitor the behavior of SCP-4217 and protect the public from its existence. Diego had only just found his footing when it gave out underneath him again. Crashing to the ground, he threw both arms over his head just in time to protect his skull from the rain of boulders that came down past him. They grazed his arms and jarred painfully against his muscles, but it was better than having them hit him in the head. Without a moment to spare, Diego got straight up to his feet 
and continued running back down the trail he had been trying to follow. The ground shifted and lurched in all directions under him, threatening to throw off his balance at any moment. Having lived in Chile his whole life, he had gotten used to earthquakes, but he had never been in the center of one like this. The problem was that the trail he had been following to get up here was disappearing fast as the dust swirled into the air and boulders landing all around him. He just had to keep running in this direction and hope for the best. There weren't any other options. But suddenly, he found himself running uphill. Stumbling forwards, Diego tried desperately to get his bearings. He had spent the previous three hours hiking up the mountains, so how was it that now that he had turned around and gone back, he was still going uphill? It was almost as if the ground was changing shape beneath him as he ran. Dust filled his lungs as he tried to wipe it away from his burning eyes. Yes, the ground was definitely going uphill, but it felt almost as if it was lifting itself up beneath him, as if some tectonic plates were grinding together, creating a new mountain beneath his feet. Diego lurched unsteadily and grabbed the nearest rock to keep his balance, feeling the ground lifting higher and higher beneath him. Then, all of a sudden, the cloud of dust broke, and he was in fresh air rising ever higher into the sky. The Andes Mountains stabbed out of the clouds all around him, cutting beautiful shapes across the horizon. He felt his own mountain steadily growing taller than any of them. He dropped down on all floors and clutched at the ground in terror as he tried his best to take in the shape of what he was now standing upon. How far would you go to prevent a cosmic-level disaster? It's one thing to save your friends and family from an armed murderer. It's another thing to fight for your country in a world war. We can even just about imagine what it means to fight for our planet, to save our species from climate change, to save our world from a meteorite. But what would a cosmic disaster look like? A calamity so broad in scale that it surpasses our ability to even perceive the threat. We could point our most advanced telescope into deep space and look straight down the middle of it and never know it was even there. And if that threat was not simply to the survival of humanity or planet Earth, but to the survival of existence itself, how far would we go to prevent it? What cruel and inhumane measures would you take to have such a threat? Or better yet, how many people would you kill to save the world? This debate is raging right now as you sit here and watch this video. Not among the Foundation, but between two SCPs so grand in scale and so advanced in nature that the Foundation has no option but to sit and listen as the pair debate what to do with the human race. SCP-4568-1 was not difficult to discover once it started moving. In fact, it was almost impossible to ignore. Earthquakes have been tearing across South America for centuries, destroying homes, taking the lives of innocent people, and fundamentally changing the shape of our planet itself. What most people do not realize, however, is that the fault line running through the Andes mountain range has actually largely been dormant during this period. The source of the earthquakes has come from something far more mysterious. Our innocent hiker, Diego, had been spending the week walking among the Andes when the earthquake struck. You would be forgiven for assuming, as Diego did, that the ground rising beneath his feet was a new mountain forming as the tectonic plates clashed together. But the staggering reality of the situation was that he found himself hiking along the back of SCP-4568-1. As the creature raised its head into the air, Diego saw the head of a serpent lifting several kilometers away from him. Its body stretched and wound its way through the mountain range, filling the valleys and running beneath his feet. The scale of SCP-4568-1 is hard to convey. Measuring over 500 kilometers in length, this serpent is longer than most U.S. states, with a 20-kilometer width. Standing on the back of it quite literally feels like standing on a mountain range. For context, the horizon at sea level is about 4.8 kilometers away, so multiply that by 4 and you'll get a sense of just how wide this thing is. Even small movements from this SCP are enough to trigger continent-wide earthquakes, with tremors being felt all the way around the world. Upon the initial discovery of this SCP, 
the Foundation was unable to determine why it remains dormant for such long periods, and seems to only awaken sporadically and for brief periods of time. That was, until SCP-4568-2 was discovered. It is little wonder that the second serpent took so long to be found. Its body is comprised almost entirely of water, sand, algae, and steam. It does not show up on sonar scans and is incredibly difficult to detect in the water, even visually. Its form is loosely defined while dormant. With broadly similar measurements to SCP-4568-1, this serpent roams the South Pacific Ocean. Any marine creatures that swim into the SCP's body find themselves undergoing beneficial mutations. Crabs grow extra pinchers, bottom feeders grow larger mouths, and sharks find themselves developing heightened senses and even extra hearts. These marine animals seem to undergo virtually no distress and are free to exit and re-enter the SCP's body at any point. Initially, SCP-4568-2 was believed to be the peaceful one of the pair. Both serpents seemed to become active at the same time. While on land, SCP-4568-1 would wreak havoc with magnitude 7 earthquakes in major metropolitan areas. The sea serpent's function was less well understood. Employing resonant frequencies and vibrations, this SCP was able to give its watery body a distinct form as it rose up from the ocean and towered above the waves. In order to maintain its shape and control its movements, this SCP employed a huge amount of energy. However, the Foundation quickly observed that it was rarely able to maintain its form for very long. As soon as the sea serpent rose out of the water, its mountainous twin would begin to move, sending tremors around the world that disrupted the frequency needed for SCP-4568-2 to remain animate. Exhausted and unable to maintain its shape, the sea serpent would fall into another period of dormancy, gliding lazily through the oceans. But this dormancy suited the Foundation. Without the constant seismic tremors, researchers could work fast. Two operating bases were set up to monitor each SCP. Two mirrored bases with mirrored teams in constant communication with one another. As soon as one team made a discovery, it was conveyed to the others and vice versa. One operating base was set up high in the Andes Mountains, specifically designed to be as earthquake-proof as possible, capable of withstanding earthquakes up to 9.9 .9 magnitude. Meanwhile, in the South Pacific Ocean, an underwater research center was built just above the seabed, with regular vessels drifting out into the unknown to gather whatever data they could about the great SCPs. Several early findings stood out. Firstly, SCP-4568-1 appeared to have a very different internal structure from its twin. Researchers initially assumed that the creature would be largely composed of earth minerals and rock, as its exterior appearance suggested. However, scans of its body indicated the presence of what can only be assumed to be artificially created components. Great gears resembling clockwork structures and even rudimentary circuitry were present throughout the creature's body. The function or origin of these gears has yet to be determined, especially as there is no evident way that their movement corresponds to the autonomy and movement of the serpent itself. The far more striking discovery, however, came when the SCP Foundation discovered a way to communicate with the two beasts. Ultra-low frequency waves capable of traveling vast distances, even light years, were discovered to be emitted from the two serpents' heads at intermittent periods. The Foundation had to develop some of the largest antenna ever created to pick up these frequencies and interpret the data coming through them. What they found were two twins locked in a fierce debate about the fate of humanity and the universe itself. It was only then that the motivations of these two serpents started to make sense. In 2010, almost as soon as the Foundation was able to tap into the frequency, they were contacted directly by SCP-4568-1. Foundation, I know that you can hear me. I will not apologize for my actions. I know that I am the reason that millions of your kind face their demise. I know your pain, and I feel it too. But I shall never apologize for it. I simply ask you to listen to myself and to my word cannot be translated. You are curious. You can be patient. Exercise that. 
and you may one day understand. And listen, the Foundation did. Efforts to contain or destroy the two serpents were put on the back burner. Instead, Foundation agents prioritized spreading disinformation across South America and beyond about the source of these earthquakes. The two serpents are far too large and far too powerful to overcome or contain. Instead, the Foundation prioritized the use of amnestic drugs, disinformation, and the creation of fringe conspiracy groups to discredit any claims of the serpents' respective existences. Meanwhile, some of the most senior leadership figures in the Foundation were, and still are, locked in a fierce debate as to what to do with the twin serpents. By listening to the communication between the two SCPs, the Foundation discovered that SCP-4568-2 is intent on wiping out the entire human race. The only thing that has prevented it from being able to do so thus far has been the existence of the other serpent. Every time that SCP-4568-2 begins to mount an attack on humanity, its land-bearing twin triggers enormous earthquakes to disrupt its progress. But why would the Sea Serpent want to destroy the human race? As Foundation generals gathered in the Deep Sea Operations Base, SCP-4568-2 came to the observation window to look them in the eyes as it told them. I am sure you can see it. How your world dies a little bit more every day. Mostly by your own hand, though. You poison the oceans, taint the rivers, blacken the skies. You do not need angels of death to destroy your world. But there is something else. I see it in the bottom of your eyes. Something unforgettable, unconceivable ideas cloaked in madness and impossible colors. Do you think I will let you drag the rest of the world down with yourselves? Do you think I will leave this world, my world, to die in flames? It sees your world, and it comes in fives. Since this revelation, the Foundation has poured countless hours and resources into trying to identify a cosmic threat. For well over a decade, many of the smartest scientists the world has to offer have looked to the night sky, scanning for this impossible color this shroud of madness, but to no avail. Some within the Foundation believe the Serpent is lying, trying to make up an excuse to justify its genocide, but information from SCP-4568-1 seems to confirm everyone's worst fears. Your minds burn bright from this, Hume. All of humanity shines from this rock, like a candle in a dark room. It sees you. An idea exists only because something thought of it. Have you ever considered how such terrible concepts could have been given form? What kind of atrocious mind could even think about it? Humans cannot conceive the colorless green. What if you are playing into this creature's hands? There appears to be an underlying implication that ideas are the source of power somehow. This colorless green this unimaginable cosmic threat seems to be a monstrous idea incarnate. But whose idea? Humanity's? There is a deep lore that the two serpents discuss with one another, one that makes little sense even to this day to the Foundation. They talk of gods and goddesses, deities of flesh, of steel and gears, and of the fives. Quite what these creatures are, if they are even creatures at all, is a mystery to the Foundation. Researchers have not discovered a way of communicating back with the two serpents directly. Attempts to mimic their language or transmit signals asking questions to them have largely been ignored. Instead, they address humanity and the Foundation as a whole, seeming to take the view of the human race as being a collective hive mind, one that they are evidently able to tap into. The pair seem uninterested in informing us as to exactly what this threat is, or explaining who the gods and goddesses are. Perhaps they assume we know these things already, or more likely, they believe that our consciousness is not yet capable of perceiving the scale and depth of the concepts that they are debating. What is clear, however, is their shared understanding that if humanity were to be eliminated, the candle was to be blown out, this cosmic threat would pass by. 
The pair have names. Trenten is the land serpent, while remaining dormant much of the time in an enormous cave system beneath the Andes Mountains. This serpent seems keen to help the Foundation in some way. Kai Kai, the sea serpent, is intent on sacrificing the human race for a greater good, one far beyond our understanding. Speaking to the Foundation in the Andes Mountains, Trenten gave a short speech that served both as encouragement and a terrible warning of the darkness to come. It is something I like about you, Foundation, about mankind. While it is easy to just take the simplest path, to just give up, there will always be some among you who refuse this path, who do the right thing. Maybe not all of you are this strong, but I can see it in your methods. Those so-called containment procedures. There will always be someone who stands up against the dark, even if it takes a thousand million years to emerge victorious. Maybe you can stop the fifth. After all, ideas can be killed with better ideas, even if it takes a thousand million years. Now go check out SCP-2317 The Devourer of Worlds, A Door to Another World, and SCP-001 The World's Gone Beautiful.